Okay, we are going to begin the meeting. Um, we do have quorum. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody. We're resuming the 14th uh, meeting of the Budget Committee. Today is, uh, we are actually, remind you that we are hearing from the public uh, this coming Monday and Tuesday with the public deputations. Um, and I'm just going to go over um, for everyone's benefit. Uh, what will be happening. So on Monday, this coming Monday, January 20th, the subcommittees are going to be at City Hall from 9.30 to 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. Um, onwards, and then at Scarborough Civic Centre from 3 to 5 and from 6 p.m. onwards. That is on Monday. On Tuesday, we're going to be, uh, the committees, uh, subcommittees will be at North York and Etobicoke Centres on Tuesday, January 21st from 3 to 5 and then from 6 p.m. onwards. If you wish to present to the budget subcommittees, please register in advance with the city clerk by emailing buc at toronto.ca and indicating your preferred location and session. Um, and just a reminder to anybody who wants to uh, to depute, we generally have you. It's not we, we don't want you to be deputing at each of Scarborough and all that. So if you have a deputation, choose which uh, venue you want to do that and and put your name down for that. So today we're going to be uh, hearing presentations on staff recommended budgets from Community Social Services Group and the Toronto Transit Commission. Um, and the presentation schedule, of course, is at the back of the room. Also, too, uh, this is the last day and last hours of getting in briefing note requests. So if you have any briefing notes, and I say this every day and every year, get them in um, as soon as possible. Um, ideally, they need to be in before lunch. Um, with respect to just the organizing of this, uh, takes a lot of work by the, uh, the clerks um, and, and they need to be able to organize them properly because today be, may be a little bit different depending on how quickly we get through this morning. Uh, we have scheduled TTC at 12 o'clock um, and we may extend lunch by a little bit to get through TTC, we're not too sure, um, but I'm anticipating that we'll get all the presentations done this morning. Uh, we'll break for lunch for 45 minutes an hour. We'll come back and do the briefing note uh, right after. So that's that's anticipated. So we can just do briefing notes very quickly after lunch, and and we'd be done. But we do need to get the briefing notes in uh, as soon as possible. Other than that, are there any other questions um, from any of the uh, my colleagues about this morning? Okay. Why don't we start the uh, the first presentation? which is the Community and Services, Community and Social Services Group. Welcome and whenever you're ready. Well, good morning, Mr. Chair, Member of Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to present Community and Social Social Services 2020 budget, both capital and operating. So this, this is just an outline of what we're going to be covering this morning. Um, there are detailed budget notes for each of the program areas. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to be not speaking in detail to all of the slides, but the entire team is here to respond to questions at the end. So we're just going to start with an overview of our service area. So in terms of what we do, Community and Social Services is very much focused on ensuring that all Torontonians and neighbourhoods have access to the programs and services they need to enable them to fully participate in Toronto's very vibrant social and economic li uh, life. And then in alignment with the City's corporate strategic plan, we are guided by Council's vision of Toronto as a caring, friendly, dynamic city that invests in quality of life. We do prioritize equity and we set our sights on meeting the needs of more, our more vulnerable population in order to support and nurture Toronto for all. And much of the work that we do in community and social services is done in partnership with other governments, community organizations and partners, institutions, businesses, and our strengthening relationships with indig Indigenous people. So there's 10 program areas that fall under community and social services. Each of those program areas provides a variety of services and as I mentioned, there are full, full uh, budget notes on each of those divisions. So improving quality of life for all Torontonians and neighbourhoods is a key outcome that all of our program areas uh, help to advance. And to deliver on this outcome, we provide a range of services within each of the divisions 
with respect to affordable and social housing, child care and family supports, employment and social assistance, cultural and recreation programs, our parks, our senior services, and the list does go on. A second uh, key outcome for our service area is stronger, safer, more resilient and equitable communities. And as you can see by the range of deliverables on this slide, we do approach community safety and resiliency holistically. We focus on determinants of well-being as well as physical and natural environments and taking an evidence-based approach in all that we do to help ensure that no one gets left behind. We support communities through our anti-violence youth engagement and crisis response programs and a variety of other services and by advancing Council's poverty reduction and confronting anti-black racism strategies. <coughs> in terms of issues, many of the issues and challenges that are faced by community and social services, in fact by the city, relate to the changing needs of a growing, evolving and increasingly diverse city, as well as the high levels of poverty, inequality and vulnerability that many of our residents and families' neighbourhoods are experiencing. Additionally, given that, as I mentioned, many of our programs are legislated, funded or cost-shared by other orders of government, any change that they make in their policy directions, their uh, legislation or regulations, often impact our service delivery. So we continually monitor and participate in intergovernmental discussions and consultations, and we continue to leverage both federal and provincial um, programs and funding to the full extent possible to help advance Council's priorities. As you're all aware, refugee claimants continue to arrive to the city on a steady basis. The flow has been pretty steady for the past three years. We're seeing on average 17 new arrivals per day. So we think this is a new norm. In the past, when we had influx of refugees, it lasted up to a year and then it would go back to normal. This has been going on for three years. So we have requested the, province, uh, the federal government for sustainable ongoing annual funding in the range of $77 million to help meet their commitments to refugees, but more importantly to help the city maintain the over 2,000 beds it's had to add to our shelter system since 2009 to accommodate this steady flow. <coughs> we do have many plans and strategies in place that Council has approved to help us address and mitigate the issues that we're facing and we continue to move forward on implementing these. I'm not going to list them all. We do provide regular updates on where we're at to committee and council, and we also post those updates on our website. So I'll now talk about the operating budget. So the 2020 recommended operating budget for invests $3.9 billion in community and social services. 28% of that is invested employment in employment and social services, and 25% in shelter support and housing administration. That includes a $251 million subsidy that Council provides to TCHC each year. And then Children's Services, Parks, Forestry and Recreation account for 16% and 12% of that investment respective, respectively, and the balance of the investment is distributed among the remaining program areas. Now in terms of funding sources, I mentioned that many of our programs are cost shared with other governments. You can see that provincial and federal funding uh, and subsidies account for 50 56% of our overall funding, a third comes from property taxes and then user fees generate approximately 4.7%. <coughs> Excuse me for this cough. Our operating budget, our investments impact families and neighbourhoods right across the city and we manage some of the largest uh, social and community uh, social services systems in all of Canada. This is not an exhaustive list but it is, does provide a sense of the magnitude and scopes of the programs and services that we investment, invest in, deliver and support. The 2020 recommended budget also includes 17.6 million for new and enhanced services, 5.3 towards poverty reduction initiatives, community, and so, and community safety and security is allocated 6.6 uh, .6 million of that investment, 2.2 for climate change and resiliency, and that 3.6 other is largely related to culture and confronting anti-black racism. So we'll quickly move to the 10-year capital plan. So the recommended 10-year capital plan invests 5.4 billion in our community and social services infrastructure and assets. And almost 50% of that is invested in state of good repair, 27% 
$1.5 billion is invested in service improvements. Growth-related projects account for 22%, and then there's $63 million that's invested in health and sa safety and legislated um, projects. In terms of funding sources, debt funds 62% of our capital plan, and then other revenues fund 19%. Those other revenues include um, Planning Act revenues, capital from current third-party uh, third funding. <coughs> so as you've heard in prior presentations, this year we've amended our, capital, our, our approach to capital based on affordability, achievability, project readiness, and the market's capacity and ability to deliver. So this year's process introduces a stage gating process, which is an industry best practice. And stage gating um, helps us ensure that we better reflect the timing and cost of our capital projects. And the process has also been amended to allow for acceleration of funding where we have the capacity to both spend and procure. In terms of state of good repair, the backlog in 2020 is just over 2.3 billion, or 16.5% of asset value. That includes 1.6 billion for the TCHC's backlog. And it declines to 12.3% of asset value by 2029. So that just concludes our presentations and we'll be very happy to respond to questions. We have provided some additional slides in the appendices that provide a little bit more detail. Thank you very much. So what we'll do, um, we'll begin, we'll go down through each of the individual <coughs> divisions uh, for questions. That seems to be the most uh, productive way to do things, um, as we did yesterday. So why don't I start with um, children's services, um, questions of staff. We'll start with Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and I'd just like to commend staff for a tough year in children's services with a lot of question marks coming from the province. Um, it seems like we were on track working towards our goal of, the num of a certain number of subsidies and ratio of subsidized spots, but that as of next year, we're going to be going the, the opposite direction. How many subsidies would be required to maintain our 40% ratio of fee subsidies to spaces um, that is stated as our minimum goal for accessibility in our child care growth strategy? Thank you. Through the chair, approximately 3,000 spaces would be required, sorry, subsidies would be required. And it's 3,000 subsidies for 2020? Uh, no, beyond 2020. Beyond 2020. So we meet, we meet our target this year, but as of next year, we wouldn't. Uh, that's correct. Changes in provincial funding. Um, will impact our ability to expand fee subsidies in 2021 and beyond. So uh, for 2017 to 19, we were on track um, to add additional subsidies as planned. What kind of funding would be required to continue on that course to meet our child care growth strategy targets? Um, through the chair, we had a... Um, uh, a reduction in expansion funding this year from the province. It was offset by a one-time contribution. That was approximately $15 million. So in order to continue to make progress, I would say minimally the $15 million in uh, expansion funding would be required to continue on the tra trajectory that we were on. And that's just for the subsidies? Uh, yeah, the uh, expansion funding can be used for subsidies and affordability based on the need in the community. I'll, I'll get to affordability now. It, it, the average fees for family are planned to stay the same for 2020, correct? That's correct. What investment would be required in 2020 to keep us on track of the goal of 20 to 25 to 40 percent of fee reduction by 2026? Um, th through the chair, approximately $3 million annually to continue to sustain and have make a minor impact. Obviously, the more funding that we can, um, we can allocate to affordability, the greater the impact. But minimally, a 2% uh, would sustain. And then beyond that, another $3 million annually. Okay. What's the average cost per fee subsidy? Is it $12,000? Uh, oh, um, for zero to four, it's approximately fifteen thousand dollars. For zero to twelve, it's approximately twelve thousand dollars. 
Sorry, for zero to four, 15,000, for four to? Zero to 12, it's 12,000. Okay, so yeah. the average? Yeah, it would be 12. The uh, infant toddler preschool fees on average are uh, more expensive. Okay, what's the budgeted increase in inflationary rates to childcare operators in 2019? The budgeted inflationary increase is approximately 2.1% for childcare operators across the system. For this year and last year? Uh, for, the, for this year, yes, and for last year, we typically go with the inflation, the cost of inflation of 2.1%. Did we factor in the higher cost, inflationary cost of food? Is that reflective in that? That, that does Wonderful. reflect the higher cost of food, the higher cost of salaries, um, that just generally the higher cost of operating annually. What was the general operating funding increase this year to childcare centers? In 19? For, sorry, for 2019? 20, 20. Or what's proposed in 2020? Uh, for 2020, uh, we are adding a cost of living increase to the general operating funding of 2%, which yes. is, yeah, how much of that share? Approximately 3 million. So it's a 2% two, 2 for the general operating. Now there's the general oper operating and the subsidy, correct? That's correct. So what what is the planned increase uh, in the subsidy, sorry, in the, is, it's called the per diem, I think, in, in some documents, isn't it? Sorry? It's the, it, a per diem rate? There's the, the general operating grant and yeah. then the per diem rate. Yes. yes. So what, what, is the, what is the increase plan for the per diem rate? 2.1%. So the so per diem's 2.1%, the general operating's 2%. It's a cost of living for um, all of the funding. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes. I'm, uh, it's going to sound like I'm asking questions about how does childcare work, but I'm trying to get at um, where the, uh, whether, whether it's an effect of the budget or an effect of, of the provincial cuts. Um, I, I can't find a note in here that, that, that gives me an update that tells me where we're at in terms of the, the three-tiered strategy of uh, you know, addressing the uh, addressing the the reducing the wait list for subsidy, um, addressing the uh, affordability factor for full fee paying parents, and we were also working on addressing the living wage of the workers within. We, we had those three targets. Um, has that been affected? Uh, have we been thrown out of whack by the provincial changes? Um, so the growth strategy phase one, I think that's what you're referring to, which um, did have targeted investments for fee subsidies, spaces, compensation. Uh, phase one was completed um, December 31st, 2019. We did complete it as originally adopted. That's right. We okay. had the available resources um, to follow the plan. We will be reporting back to Council in 2020 on the outcomes. So we have been measuring the impact um, and the outcomes for families over the past three years. We'll also be coming forward with a proposed phase two plan for the next three years, which will take into consideration uh, provincial and federal funding commitments, as well as city commitments. So today's budget, uh, uh, what we're looking at today is phase one completed, so this budget is really based on the resources available, because we, <coughs> we haven't adopted a new phase two. That's correct. And I would just add that this budget um, adds a new city investment over projected actuals to ensure that we are preserving services and sustaining growth so that we're not going backwards. It allows us to sustain and uh, meet cost of living. But coming forward, we will have the next three-year iteration of the growth strategy, and we'll be bringing that to council. And will we still be able to, to attack uh, the, uh, uh, the living wage of the, the child care workers themselves when, when they've canceled the minimum wage? Are we, are we going to do anything in that area? Um, or, or is that reliant on, on our provincial partners as well? The growth strategy is very much reliant on funding from all three levels of government and um, both the federal and provincial. I would note that the federal government through their recent mandate has um, signaled new investments in childcare, particularly um, speaking about compensation for 
the early childhood staff. We are um, awaiting more information on that, but should new investments from the federal government be forthcoming, we will be able to obviously apply those directly in the City of Toronto to improve the outcomes for that workforce. Okay, and we, we, we heard your answer on launch day that the reduction in, in, in positions largely impacted by being able to move some of those ARC programs over to, to the school boards to run directly. Uh, but in the notes, it talks about there, there are a range of things here. Um, are, are some of the positions, admin positions, the, the, the business of, uh, of moving towards online means testing instead of everybody having to go to meet with someone in person, are there positions being affected by other changes? Or is the whole 33 just direct workers no longer needed in ARC? Through, through the chair, you're correct. Some of those positions were about a service realignment where children were, are now receiving service in the school. We do have eight positions that are a result of the ending of one-time provincial programs, um, technology improvements, moving to online services for families, um, and, and really changes in the provincial reporting. The province has re begun to reduce some of the um, reporting requirements and streamline that. So we've been able to reduce essentially admin positions as a result of that. Okay. And, and we, uh, have, we, have we done the change of people having to go to visit to bring their pay stubs or, or is that... Is that up and online now? The uh, My Child Care account is launched. Um, yeah. Yes, we have approximately 15,000 families now using that for their simple transactions. Um, the piece about the pay stubs is um, actually very much top of mind. We're um, enabling families now to be able to upload their documents, which means they won't have to bring them in. That will continue to evolve and um, has a real value for families who then do not have to take time off work to bring in simple documents or, you know, do simple transactions. Right, right. Okay. Um, those are my questions for now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Councillor Nunziata? Yeah, I, ju I just have one question. As far as uh, uh, new daycare centres, um, so what is the status of that? Because I know that in, in, in our area that when development applications come in and, and some of them have been approved as well, is that we encourage the applicant to, to build a daycare centre for the city and to provide uh, a daycare centre. So where are we at that as building new centres out in... Uh, sorry, through the chair, we have a 10-year capital plan mm -hmm. that um, we will be adding about 2,900 new spaces this year, um, and over the 10 years, about 7,000 spaces. So we always look for opportunities through new developments, through partnerships with school boards, uh, when there's provincial funding allocations. We're always looking for opportunities to add new spaces uh, for childcare because there's quite a need for that. Yeah, so where are we at, the, uh, at that uh, point um, on the status of that? Because I know that there's been a number of development applications that were approved in, in our area where uh, a daycare center is being built, part of the development. So do you have like an update on that, on how many spaces that we would see well, in the very near future because development yeah. is on mm -hmm. its way? For 2020, yeah. we'll be adding 2,900 spaces. From development. Yeah, partially from development, yeah. partially by working with school boards. Um, in our capital plan, it actually outlines the projects that are committed with the timing. But there's also other development and Section 37 projects that are ongoing. We work closely with the developers yeah. um, to ensure that the space is licensable and available. Um, so, you know, if you have... Uh, would like an update on a specific project, we'd be happy to no, do No, no, it's that. okay, but it would be good to get a list of the ones that are upcoming, you know, um, in 2020, 2021, that are, all, that are being built at this point, so out, we get an out. idea where they are and how many, yeah. And we have that information, we can provide it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Chair, I have one additional question that I overlooked. It should be very quick, if you wouldn't mind, to, to Children's Services. Yeah. All it is is with the transitional, um, the, with the, the switch over to the in-school program that's outlined here, does that close any child care um, centers, not programs, knowing that some of these programs are shifting? Does it close any centers? Uh, through the chair, 
um, a number of those centers remain open and continue to provide service for infant, toddler, and preschool. Um, some of the centers are were in the school, so although the Children's Services will not be offering the service. The school board is offering the service, so essentially the, the center is not closed. We're not mothballing any buildings as a result of this. That's correct. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, any other questions? I just had a few. Um, just can you, I know you talked about that with uh, Council Carroll's um, questions, but can you just reiterate again the, um, about the provincial download and some of the future pressures that you will be facing as we move forward with child, Children's Services? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, the province um, early this year signaled changes in funding and cost share arrangements. They reversed some of those changes in 2019, um, resulting in um, uh, about a $2.8 million shortfall in provincial funding. Going into 2021 and 2022, they have signaled additional changes in cost sharing um, and administration. We do not have the details on that because the province is also reviewing their current funding formula. So once that new funding formula has been established and the province provides us with detail, we can estimate what the impacts will be. But as you can see through this budget, we're already taking steps um, to make sure that our investments are, um, are being directed where they have the best outcome. Uh, and with regard to the, the new space, as you mentioned, 2,900 new spaces coming up this year, then 7,000 within. What's the period of time for that? That's The 7,000 is over 10 years. Okay. Um, and when you're looking at those, those pressures, have you, can you estimate the operating pressures? Now, we have the facilities, they're going to be built, uh, but have you estimated the operating pressures that will happen as these come online? Uh, yes, we have. So we know that uh, a centre with an average of about 49 children, the annual operating pressure is about $550,000. The province has committed operating funding for approximately 17 of those projects. So uh, as we reported out earlier this year, there will be an operating pressure in future years, but we don't expect that pressure to materialise until possibly 2024 when provincial operating funding has not been committed, and there may be changes through federal funding or provincial direction by that time. Okay, thank you. Okay, next we'll go on to economic development and culture. Questions of staff? Councillor Layton. Yes, um, thank you very much. When was the decision made to uh, not to fund the distressed retail support. Why was that decision? Uh, two aspects to it. We are doing some funding for that already. Part of the funds freed up from the cancellation of the vacant unit rebate program have already applied, for instance, on the Eglinton Crosstown, trying to uh, help there. Uh, additional funds need a policy basis, a solid policy and research basis. We have two research studies in the field right now, one on the future of retail, to help understand the full spectrum of forces impacting Main Street retail. And the second one is taking a look at what other jurisdictions uh, and what other programming would make sense to help distress retail. Those studies are uh, being finalized as we speak. And until they're finished, we don't have a solid basis to recommend programming going forward. Uh, so our hope is those studies will come forward in the next three, four months with recommendations. Uh, we'll have time to hopefully do a little bit of piloting and testing, uh, and then in the budget for 21, roll out some more robust programming. So, so where did that number come from, the 1320 for the distressed retail support? Where did it originally come from? Was what, it the, in terms of the, one, the, the programming that we put forward? Well, whatever the, the appendix for. Right, so that, that was, uh, we wanted to uh, recommend some standby funding uh, for when the programs came forward, and it was felt it was more appropriate to wait for those programs wait, to come forward. Wait for the studies to be completed. Yeah. Um, now, I noticed that there's some money coming to the year of public art. I think the number was two point something. Well, there's 2.5 million for both the year of public art and increasing the investment in culture. Uh, which has been a council uh, mandate in terms of the $25 per capita. Uh, uh, 500000 of that uh, has been earmarked for one-time year public art, and part of the remaining $2 million will be used uh, 
to help the public art on a recurring basis, all getting ready for the year 2021, which is the announced year of public art. So, can I just make clear? So, the 2.5 million is it all year of public art no. funding? So, part of it is going to increase the culture. Sort of general Two million is going on a permanent basis to increase culture. Half a million is going on a one-time basis to uh, for the year of public art. But part of the two million permanent will also be used for the year of public art. If you get what I'm trying to okay. say. Okay. But then what about the additional 500,000? Is that? That's for the year of public art, but it will not be repetitive money. So it won't remain in the, in the, base the arts budget. cultural envelope Correct. in the city. But we're increasing that envelope by two million. Correct. What was the in in increase last year? Two million. Two million. And the increase the year before? I'd have to look it up. It was more than that because okay. we were ramped up to speed up the introduction to get to the $25 per capita. Okay. It appears, and, and maybe it was just in my original read, that this was all year of public art funding. Um, just, I, I, I don't know if that was just my read, but I, I'm glad to hear that it's got wider application. Thank you. Bradford. Thanks very much. Uh, to the chair, Table 2A on page 7, um, there's a line there that's showing that the provincial subsidies are up 188% um, year over year. Um, what is that trend? Is that $1.3 million in addition to provincial subsidy there that we're receiving this year? So the province has been funding several entrepreneurship programs, uh, summer start startup and summer camp, I can't remember the exact names, uh, over the number of years. And when the new administration took, uh, came in, there was a pause in some of the funding, so our funding was cut in 2019. Uh, they've re-established those programs uh, in a more robust f fashion, and so we're now getting more money. It's really pass-through money. It's grants that go to entrepreneurs, plus uh, some money for the administration of the program that we do. So 188%, that is because it was a cut that has now been restored with additional dollars. That's how we landed on that? That's correct. And, it, and it's money from the province that we just flow through. How do we decide and determine and allocate what that goes towards? So the programs, the two programs the province has established have very clear uh, guidelines for that. They're application-based programs with criteria for accepting uh, the applicants. Does any of that, uh, I'm going back to Councillor Layton's questions around the distressed retail, and I know that we have some, some programs that we're supporting uh, that. Is any of this money additionally going towards local retail programs? Yes, we're trying, uh, it's going towards retail entrepreneurs, and we try to um, encourage uh, these entrepreneurs to apply for the program and they could well be entrepreneurs that are in areas of distressed retail. I don't have specific numbers on that though. So we have new programs intended to address distressed retail in different ways but there is still you know when you just look at the budget it's a, you know there's that component there that is below the line. In this context this retail environment context uh, do we need to be doing more or different things to support distressed retail uh, main streets? Yes, we, we do, and we're coming forward with a report in the next three or four months to address that very point, Councillor. Okay. Uh, and then last question, uh, that same table on seven. Um, in 2018, we had other expenditures at 5.6 million actual. Uh, 29 actuals is 53,000. Uh, and we're continuing to drop that down to 42,000. Um, could you just elaborate on, on what that is and what that's responding to? I think you're... Uh, you're looking at... This. Are you looking at it on the expense side or the revenue side, Councillor? Uh, expenditures. Did you say five million? That's what I said. Yeah. So that got five point six. That's, that's an error in the chart. It got corrected in a later edition. Okay. So it should have been up above under grants and transactions. Five million of it. Okay. 
So it's it's very the the revised number is sixty eight thousand. So, and the grants and 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 uh, transfers is five million more than what you you see on your sheet. Okay. So, so then I we're actually for the error in the earlier edition. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. That's all my questions. Thank you, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is about um, Transform TO and your green tech and your GMAP program. So how are you looking to interface with the other groups and city departments to advance those issues? Because some of it falls within your purview as well. Correct. So we're working closely with the top office and with the EED in terms of uh, supporting uh, their programs and uh, we see GMAP as, as, as we're a leader in that. GMAP for everybody else who's not familiar with it, is a program that allows city divisions to test and pilot uh, energy saving, uh, green sustainable innovations. Um, so we've, we're sitting on a working group. Uh, we have one staff member fully devoted to it. And uh, we feel that the cooperation and coordination we're doing with those divisions has been very successful. Um. And do you see either in this year or next year expanding on that? Uh, right now, we're, we're flatlined on that effort uh, in terms of budget allocation and staff allocation. Um, okay. um, how do you look at um, like the return on investment for your different programs, and have you evaluated um, how it's working in different areas of the city? Are you talking about the, the program we were just talking about? No, no, in, in general? general. So tourism or, you know, big programs that are, you know, kind to st stimulate economic development and create jobs. Like, how do you look at the metrics amongst the different areas? For example, Scarborough, Etobicoke, downtown, um, north part of the city. So we have not generally broken it out by area in terms of um, the number of jobs created, the amount of investment attracted. Um, uh, we could do that. Uh, or at least take an estimate at that. Um, we do, for our entrepreneurship services, we do follow-up surveying of all of the uh, individuals that we interact with. Uh, for other programs, we measure uh, at the outset what uh, applicants say will their investment in space or the number of new jobs created, and we track that and report on that. Uh, and we can do that by geography. We currently report on a citywide basis. Uh, those things. Um, we, uh, my answers sound more uh, comprehensive than uh, the reality is that we have uh, um, uh, more we could do in terms of uh, showing results, sort of a results-based accountability framework, which uh, the new CFO is bringing in and the um, uh, chief, chief of staff to the new city manager. Uh, so we're working on that. Our programs where we have direct investments that are easy to identify, we measure those well. Those programs that are a little bit harder, like our sector work that we do, uh, is much harder to track and measure, and we need to do some more work to become more fulsome in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry to go back to distressed retail because I know you were talking about it while I was out. Uh, uh, I was asked to clarify uh, something uh, that's coming up in a briefing note in another division. Um, so I'm sorry if this question has been asked. So the, the distressed retail is not included in the budget. Um, so what is happening to the, to the revenue captured by cancelling the rebate program? So is that just being used to money. balance the budget? So there is some money already committed to distressed retail that came through the 2018 and 2019 19, budgets. Right. So and that is that work wrapped up now or, no, or it's there's ongoing. something continuing? So there's continuing. The digital Main Street program, the programs to support retailers on Eglinton Avenue all continue. Um, what uh, there is uh, nominally or, or, or uh, I'm not sure what the right accounting phrase to use um, there is money still set aside, um, but we have um, two studies in the field counselor, one on retail and one on distressed uh, programming that have yet to report out um, to yet be completed, so we're going to bring that 
to council in the next uh, three or four months. And those, program, those reports will provide a program and policy basis for further investment that we will bring to council to be considered this year, maybe piloting a bit of it this year, and then so the money more that's fulsomely set in the next, next budget. So the money set aside would, would fund whatever's recommended in this in-year report? That is what would be up to council uh, to decide in the future, yes. So what was contemplated to be done with the $1.3 million that was in the request for this budget? If it was included, what was it going to do? Well, we were nebulous about it, which is why it's not in there, uh, because we wanted to create placeholders for when the reports came out. But it makes more sense for us to come up with those programs first and have council consider them before assigning specific numbers to specific programs. So if you don't mind my asking, what is set aside then? How much is set aside? Uh, well, as you can see from Appendix 4, uh, we wanted to identify 1.3 million. There is more than that, potentially available, uh, hopefully available, uh, but that's up to Council down the road. So if, so if, if you do the report and you discover you should do all the things that were, were contemplated in a 1.3 request, the, the money's there to do it? Uh, that would be up to council down the road to decide. Oh, I I when that report comes forward. But when you say down, I'm sorry to belabor this, but when you say down the road, if we get a report in the middle of the year and it says retail is distressed in the following places and we should be doing work, is that money there right then and there, or do we have to wait till the 2021 budget and fight for it as a new and enhanced piece? Uh, through the chair, uh, the money for 2020 has been leveraged for other initiatives. Um, when we come back with uh, the report, we'll be able to identify what the need is and bring forward for council's consideration how it would be allocated. So um, are we, are we thinking of it in the context of how much money uh, we loaded into the budget by canceling the vacancy rebate program so that the work is in that, that, that range and scope? Because that's, it was meant to, to replace that. And now it seems like we're taking the vacancy rebate money we no longer uh, uh, have to pay out and using it to balance the budget. So the thing that was supposed to offset it is not gonna be fundable. You, you, you see my concern. Because now three years will pass. We'll just get used to balancing the budget with that money. What? Yeah, yeah. Um, you see my concern. Yes. I'm just wondering if in, in future reporting, we can always remind ourselves of the revenue we captured by discontinuing that rebate. We phased it out over three years. It was enough money to make sure we could always handle depressed and distressed retail strips. We have future transit builds all over town. So the idea of distressed retail in places is not gonna, it's not gonna go away. It's gonna, it's gonna get worse. So, so the idea of how much money we, we no longer have to give out for vacancy rebates has to be captured in those reports so we remember what it is we're proposing and, and that we did at some point in time load our books up with the money to do them. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Point was taken. Uh, Councillor Nunziata. Yeah, I just have one question and just, I want to thank you very much for the study we're doing in Mount Dennis, first of all. Thank you to that. Um, as far as the, <clears throat> excuse me, the BIAs um, with the facade uh, program, so we, um, we, we are funding um, the, the programming. Um, we're, we're not making any cuts to that, correct? Correct. Correct. It's an important program, and we work uh, closely with BIAs to improve the facades in their areas. The program is somewhat responsive to the BIA's abilities to cost share with us and to work with us, but we're very supportive of that program. So in light that there's a number of new BIAs that are popping up in the past couple of years if it come through and been approved, so um, with the additional BIAs, are we looking at um, increasing that budget as they, as they come forward? Uh, I think there'll be enough room in the budget to manage those. Mm -hmm. uh, our BIA spending is traditionally being below what was budgeted. Right. And so I'm confident that we can meet the demand of the new BIAs. Because a lot of them are not applying for the Correct. grant or, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Seeing no other questions, we'll move on now to the Housing Secretariat. Questions? Councillor Layton. Thank you very much. Um, when are we going to find out what the goals are for 2020? Because there's, it, it doesn't list them in the document. So through the chair, the implement, we're working on the implementation plan and uh, we were directed by council to come back in the first six months, so by June, end of June. Because be And a little... that'll break down the target by year. But, but how do we budget for a target when we don't, we don't know? So. <coughs> like the target for the new affordable rental housing approvals is to be determined, yet we're setting the budget for a yet to be determined target. Is there a range? Like, do we at least have some? So if, if you recall, much of what we, the monies we use to finance our affordable housing projects comes from other orders of government and from city and for foregone revenues from the city. So as those projects come forward, we will come forward and work with uh, financial planning on how best to uh, find those fundings, but mo a, a good portion of that is, is from foregone revenue, so you won't necessarily see it as a budget line. Okay. Um, so what was our 2019 budgeted uh, target for in, in, in that, uh, in, in, uh, there's no appendix listed there, but on the bottom of page two. What did we budget for? for new affordable rental housing unit approvals. <coughs> so our target up and to the, every year for the past 10 years before we council adopted the new plan was around 1000 new um, affordable housing units per year and the funding as I say came largely from provincial and federal funding and um, the, the reserve we do collect DCs that are directed to affordable housing and foregone revenues like the, the waiving of permit fees, et cetera. Okay. Um, on page seven, and I know this value is very small, but when you see a 9,000% increase, it, it kind of caused your, your, your level of interest to spike. Under other expenditures, the, the 2019 actual to staff recommended base budget goes up quite considerably. What is, is there something specific that's related to? Those are the Housing Now sites. Council approved 11 sites, transit-oriented sites, in order to develop uh, mixed communities, which would include affordable housing. Three of the RFPs are out now, and we have a fourth site that would be ready to go. So a lot of that is the pre-development work that we need to, to undertake for those sites. And that's not done by staff? That's done by somebody else? It's a combination of staff. Um, we work with CREATEO. We sometimes we have to bring in consultants to do different assessments, environmental assessments, et cetera. So that would be for consultants and other predominantly. Okay. Um, the, the funding for the creation of the housing commissioner, that's not included in this budget, but it was directed by council at the last meeting. That's correct. Council asked us to report back on, they've asked us to establish the housing commissioner and just to report back on how best to do that, whether you leverage an existing uh, office or whether you create a whole new um, position. So we'll be reporting back in the fall on how to do that. So we'll be all. So I, I remember it being much more specific that it was to create the office, but without anything budgeted in the office, we can be pretty sure that it's not gonna get created in the 2020 year. So the, the direction was to establish the office, but there was a number of options that we could use. So the reason we didn't make a specific recommendation in the Housing Now report was that we're working with our uh, the city manager's office and intergovernmental to look at whether we should be leveraging one of the existing accountability officers to fulfill that function or whether we should be creating a whole new position in office. That's what we'll be reporting back on and we'll work with financial planning on estimating the costs and a funding source. And that's not going to be until the fall. My recollection is the council direction was by the fall before the 2021 budget. I, 
I distinctly remember the intent that was coming out of budget, out of council that was to establish it next year, but we'll have to have that conversation with the, uh, with those that drafted that motion. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, any other questions? Seeing none, um, and let's move on next to Toronto Employment and Social Services. Being no question, oh, okay. Councillor Layton okay. some questions. Um, how many cases? How many cases are expected to be handled by an OW caseworker on average? Uh, the average caseload per worker is uh, about a hundred cases. And has that changed over time? Uh, we, it's maintained at a pretty steady level uh, over time. The complexity of the cases has increased, I would say that, but uh, um, we've also reduced the amount of administration to focus more time on service planning with clients directly. And we're expecting a reduced caseload next year? Through the chair, yes. Uh, the reduced, the caseload is projected to be 83,000. Uh, we're running about 83,000 uh, at the beginning of the year. Our budget for 219 was 86,000. And do we do we know what's attributing to the decrease in the in well I um, load? hope that some of it is about our efforts of returning people to employment. Uh, certainly, some of our refugee uh, case or asylum seeker caseload have left the caseload quite quickly. They're coming onto the caseload and they're leaving the caseload quite quickly. So we have a bit of churn there. Okay, um, that's good to hear. Can, can you provide more detail in the 2.3 million of savings that's coming from the Human Services Integrated Project, Integration Project? It's listed on page 15. Uh, through the chair, um, that is, the savings that are projected are projected over time. Those savings will not be in 2020, uh, but they're related to reduced administration and duplication. Uh, so when clients enter our system, they'll be telling their story once. We'll be documenting uh, the details of the case once for the three divisions. And so there are, are savings of that type. Do, they, do we document it three times now? Um, yes, people are entering our system now through three separate programs and three separate applications. So often they do have to retell their story. One of our successes is that in 2019, in December, we did launch our integrated call channel uh, for the three divisions. So that uh, has been launched, a single number where clients call. We are uh, taking the call in an integrated way, documenting their needs across the three divisions. Um, the kids at CompU Scholarship. Kids and computers, yes. It, this is due to finish. Is it due to finish? Like, is there a wrap up date? Uh, what you're looking at is the reserve fund is winding down. So the amount of money that is available is winding down. We have been working to reform that uh, program. We're now calling it. Uh, Tech, technology investments for families, and we're integrating it within service planning for families in general. There is more of a focused uh, approach, uh, given the current environment of availability of technology in libraries and schools, et cetera. We'll be focusing our investments on children with special needs. So the program's changing that will... Yes, we'll change... change uh, to meet the changing times and the changing needs of children. Okay. The, the sick leave reserve fund, it shows a negative balance for 2022. Which reserve fund, sorry? The, the sick leave reserve fund, page 22. Okay, that's a corporate fund. Could you respond? <coughs> Just wondering if we're needing to top something up or 
Um, through the chair, <clears throat> so we'll be continuously reviewing the reserves, the adequacy of the reserves. Um, we'll have to look into further the 2022 and see essentially what would be driving that and options to correct it. Because it's, it, it's not insignificant, the, uh, the impacts it looks like. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Excellent. Okay, Toronto Paramedic Services. Seeing no questions. Uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Carolyn. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm just uh, uh, racing to get the Wi-Fi to come to. The, so the increase in, in the programming here, the increase in positions is part of a, uh, an upgrade to an industry standard. If you could walk me through that quickly. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor. So the request for uh, service uh, increases are to the demand of the service that we're experiencing now. So the, the challenge we have right now is um, our response to critical patients um, the, our performance is, is, is dropping. So if I, if I refer you to uh, page 11, the story uh -huh. is, I can walk you through the charts that talk a little bit yes, about here the we are, yes. pressure. Mm -hmm. So as you can see in the first chart, it speaks to the call volume is the increases that we've seen over the last multiple years is in red. And our performance to, in terms of response to critical patients is identified by the blocks. And you can see it's gone up. Mm -hmm. The response time standard is set by the province in terms of uh, the uh, ability to reach those critical patients. So you can see how it's dropped. Mm -hmm. What hasn't happened over the past three years is an increase in the number of staff to support the response. So that's the basis of the request. So the, so the, the response time is actually, uh, 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 there's, a, there's a target response time set by the province. So are we getting our full share? Uh, are they cost sharing to the, to the, the fullest uh, degree of, uh, of the formula throughout the division to bring these new positions in? Uh, yes, it's a, it, the cost share program is a, um, it's a lag funding element. Yeah. So we'll get the money the following year in the budget cycle. Right. So we have to put the money up so that the, uh, this year uh, that those enhancements uh, mm -hmm. for 2020, we won't actually uh, fund those until October. So the, right. the, there's an element of delaying that funding component. The province right. has committed, though, to responding to the growth factor so that they've, uh, in, in April of this year, they, as you know, they or eight, April of 2019, they talked about land ambulance grant funding and some of the changes. Yes. They changed their position on growth, and they have said that they were going to support uh, lag funding in the growth side of it for 2020. So I'm off that. So we should receive that money. But we still do the onboarding and the training, and then the funding comes later. Absolutely. So that's the piece. That's the piece I was worried about because this is a lot of positions. Um, are Are you confident you have the capacity to onboard that many in one year? What What's our our regime for how we bring them in? Because that's that's a lot coming in in one year. I haven't I haven't seen the division do that before. So if we gotta if we gotta be the upfront funder of the onboarding process. Um, is that a realistic number to be able to do this year? And are we putting the money in there in, in annualized dollars or have you sort of lagged the, the money in the budget based on how fast you can bring them in? That's correct. That's why we're starting in October. October 1st is the funding. Right. Um, but we have increased our capacity to select, onboard, and, and operationalize those paramedics for the year. Okay, so, so have, you're ready to go. ramping up. And then by the time we get the annualized chunk, we'll also see our first deposit from the province. Absolutely. Okay, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McKelvey. Um, thank you. Just so it's clear, how many net new paramedics will you be hiring this year? Uh, 62. 62. And then can you just speak briefly to the modernization activities that you're doing and proactively um, checking on frequent flyers, et cetera, and how that's resulting in efficiencies and how that's being expanded this year? Or is it being expanded this year? Uh, actually, in 2020, it's not being expanded. Um, so the past, two, the past few years, we've been invest the city has been investing in community paramedics, and the community paramedic program is looking at frequent users of EMS and linking them with community service and healthcare services to avoid the call to EMS. So we've been very successful at visiting uh, uh, those patients. So this past year, 
we were able to visit 500 of those patients. And we've seen, we expect to see uh, over time about a 25% reduction in calls that those folks um, have for us. We've also started to identify uh, locations in, of high EMS users, and some of those involve TCHC buildings with a lot of seniors. So just in visiting three buildings this year, we've also seen a reduction of 15% in their calls back to us. So the modernization component that the province has started, the consultation is, uh, is progressing this year. Uh, we're really focusing with them on new models of care. So new models of care speak to alternate destinations, treat and leave programs, uh, different access for services for patient cohorts, because currently paramedic services must transport patients to hospital emergency departments. So the challenge we run in with the hospital emergency departments is the throughput issue. The throughput issue. So paramedics sit, wait for transfer of care to occur quite a long time. So the goal is to improve the alternate destination location ability to reduce the time on task so we can free up paramedics sooner and they'll be available for calls. And what is the average? Sorry, my microphone's not on. What's your current average wait time at hospitals? So in, in, in 2019, so we use 90 percentiles, so not averages. So the, that, that wait time in, in hospitals actually went up uh, 6%. So that wait time in hospitals right now is 93 minutes at the 90th. And how are you um, modernizing what the paramedics are doing at that time so that you can get out faster? Like, are they sharing off on their lunch breaks at that time? Do they both need to stay with patients? Are they allowed to pool multiple patients together? Like, how, how are we able to use that time more effectively, given that it's not our struggle, it's a provincial, the province is creating that problem for us? How can we Great navigate question. that better? Great question. So we have policies and processes that allow paramedics to double up certain patients so that they can look after one paramedic, paramedic can look after multiple patients based on acuity. So the challenge at times is that the two paramedics will have to look after that one patient. The province provides funding through, through uh, our service directly to the hospitals to fund uh, uh, beds in the hallways that paramedics can transfer patients to. So they provide nursing staff for those patients. So an ongoing process there. Um, we also have two mechanisms. So our I we'll have a dedicated person that provides hospitals with their updated performance reports. We give them a report card. So every day information is shared back and forth in real time and that they get a report card on performance with respect to the other hospitals with regard to their transfer of care time. We also meet quarterly with the ED leads of each hospital to talk about their distribution of patients and the amount of time it takes paramedics to transfer of care off. So it's a constant dialogue process of updating information so that they really know in real time uh, how that works. Right now, it's very busy. We're in the flu season. So fl uh, throughput in hospitals is very challenging. So I support that with additional staff in the hospitals, management staff to help the paramedics move those patients through with the hospital. So our key piece is we need to keep availability in the community. So it's a, it can be a challenge at times. And that's the issue that we run into with uh, response to critical patients when that amb amb ambulance availability is not there. Uh, thank you for everything you do to uh, keep us safe. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Seeing no questions, uh, the questions will move on next to uh, Toronto Park, oh, sorry, Parks, Forestry and Recreation. Councillor Layton to begin. Thank you very much. Uh, first, on the urban forestry side of the budget, what's contributing to the 17% reduction in revenues to forestry? So, through the chair, as noted on uh, in the in the uh, analyst notes, um, the forestry budget, the service level actually remains unchanged, except for some adjustments we've made on the EAB program. We have made a change around our cash in lieu program, which used to be contributed. Uh, from a revenue and expense basis into the budget, we're now contributing, contributing it directly to the reserve. So as it appears as a revenue loss, there's also an offsetting expenditure and it's all uh, sort of comes out evenly around the contribution we're now making directly to the tree canopy reserve. So instead of coming in as revenue, it's going into the... That's correct. ...the reserve fund. That's right. No impact on service levels at all. So and there may be an easy explanation for this as well. Um, there's a 5% reduction in urban forestry spending. How's that, uh, like, can you explain how that is coming about? 
So uh, through the chair, there is some uh, adjustments we have made uh, around phasing out the Emerald Dash Borer program. So that's where that's reflected. And that was uh, originally planned as part of that program. So this is a planned reduction. That's correct. As part of EAB. That's correct. Okay. I, I, on Tommy Thompson Park, so there's, do I understand this correctly? We haven't included funding to provide maintenance for Tommy Thompson Park. How does that work? So through the, through the chair, Tommy Thompson Park, uh, um, as you may know, is, is currently not uh, completely operated by the City of Toronto. There is a transition. It's currently with TRCA. Uh, because of some of the improvements, we haven't taken on the park as a, as a full park yet because of the agreement around the remediation and the erosion control pieces that need to be completed. Um, we do already do some maintenance in Tommy Thompson Park, and this request was based on uh, our uh, observation of the amount of use of Tommy Thompson Park and an increased need for some additional maintenance and operating support in the park. So the service level will remain as it is right now and not be increased in this budget year. So just so we're clear, TRCA manages the maintenance of the park, but we have done some It's a, It's a joint program. There's a, there, it's a jointly operated right now. Various pieces are operated by different entities, but we're both in the park doing different types of operating. So where, where do currently the resources to do the maintenance that we do in Tommy Thompson Park pulled? They're pulled regionally? From the park's budget. There's a, there's a park's allocation within the, the south district around Tommy Thompson Park operations. Okay. So there's something, there's something in the park. It, it's not like we're doing nothing or no or just borrowing staff from down the down the road no no it's there. been part of our program for a few years now okay um, there's been a slight increase in the state of good repair budget from 2019 um, but we underspent in 2019 by about seven million is that correct that's correct I'm not sure which page you're looking at but in, in general our state of good repair funding has increased quite substantially over the last four or five years as you can see in, in the charts so we're, we're pro projecting our 2019 state of good repair spending to be close to 90%, I think it's 88% on the state of good repair line, and our overall capacity to spend in our current budget, uh, the overall capital budget at about 78%. So our state of good repair funding has increased quite substantially, and that's uh, been a result of our ability to spend to spend the uh, to spend the dollar. So, is there a reason why we haven't been able to? There, there is through the chair. We have for the last four or five years worked quite hard to try and get our spend rate up, and that's been a planned approach with our partners in financial planning. We've increased the amount of staff we have on the state of good repair piece of it, so that we've been able to advance uh, more contracts more expeditiously and get more work done. So, you've increased staff to advance contracts quicker. That's correct. Great. It's been a successful approach for us. Sorry, I'm just trying to write down the answers as, uh, as you give them. Um, on the ravine strategy that was re released last week, great work. Um, the anticipated impacts aren't felt till future years. Knowing that the strategy is complete, if approved, could work begin towards the end of 2020 on the operational elements of the plan? Through the chair, we are positioned, and uh, uh, we can answer these questions during the ravine strategy as well uh, when it comes forward next week. Uh, we are prepared on many of the operational items to advance them as, as fast as the money is available, uh, especially on the operating side where uh, we're talking about seasonal positions that can be put in place as, as soon as we need them. Uh, and the two areas of operational um, support are in the ravine litter clearing and invasive species, correct? That's correct. It's invasive species management and ravine litter pickup, invasive species management. Uh, we're uh, recommending uh, in the ravine strategy starting in 2021 um, and moving over a three year period to get to an annual spending of just over $2 million. And on the litter uh, collection, uh, we're recommending in the ravine strategy again starting in 2021. Um, an annual allocation of just over $650,000 to advance that program. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, Councillor uh, Layton uh, went to a place, uh, I was gonna go, in ravine maintenance, um, 
Uh, w the questions I'm getting, we keep hearing, when we talk about uh, ravine maintenance, we keep hearing about litter pickup and things like that. Uh, some of the concern that, that I hear uh, from residents are, are more in the, in the, the heavy duty uh, issues within uh, maintenance, uh, uh, relocating storm damaged trees, things like that, the bigger work. Um, and, and there are places in the world where there's a stark contrast between uh, the TRCA area and you get to the line and then, and then our policy seems to be just leave it where it is and let the tree decompose unless it's flooding a, a water course or something like that. What about the, beyond the litter pickup, what about the, the sort of naturalizing the ravine work? Is that still part of the, the strategy? And is the timeline for that a little different than the things that the mayor was, was sort of showcasing today? Right, so through, through, the, through the chair, there's a number of different uh, investments that are recommended in the ravine strategy. Uh, litter pickup and invasive species management are the, two, are, are the two items that we hear the most from residents about around their largest concern. On the naturalization piece of it, we are experiencing changes in the in the urban forest within the ravine yeah. system, and we, uh, we we talked a little bit about those when the tree canopy study came forward last week. I, I think the answer to that is we have funds already operating funds allocated within the ravine system uh, on an annual basis to do naturalization and management of those areas. Uh, I, I think now that the strategy has been approved, we need to revisit especially some of those sensitive areas to see if we need to change and reallocate some of our dollars towards those things. Okay, so if it's addressed on an operating basis. So if a big thing happened, um, you know, if if there, if there was a big hit from extreme weather or something mm -hmm. like that, um, you, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to do it immediately, but th at that point are we into the realm of, let's propose a capital project and go in and renaturalize a ravine that's a bit messed up? Through, through the chair, uh, that certainly we can do both of those things, and, and we have done a number of different approaches. An example in this year's budget is with the disaster mitigation uh, the, and disaster mit mitigation relief DMAF funding. Uh, we're actually seeing a, uh, a two-year spend specific to the items that you're talking about, which is uh, looking at the damage that's been done, not just to the urban forest, but also to a number of different areas, and how to remediate some of that damage so that it doesn't get any worse. So there's a number of different ways we can address those issues. Uh, and we have been, uh, when these issues come up, have reported to council on, on items around whether we need to change our service levels to do that. Okay, um, there, there are a couple of things in here where uh, we're, we're planning big outcomes and I can't believe how little is going into the budget for them. Swim to Survive, for only a couple hundred uh, thousand, we're, gonna, we're actually gonna add 18,000 kids to the program. Is uh, that is that because they're all part-time uh, instructors? So through, through the through the chair, this is a cost-shared program. First of all, with the Red Cross, uh, but but also um, with the school board. So as as you know, we're the at, coming to the end of a four or five-year program around how to implement the full scope of this program. So we do believe we can move. You know, we know the cost very well around uh, what it costs. We're not talking about a a uh, ten week program. It's a very short program that has the capacity to uh, accomplish its goals quite quickly. And I think these are the appropriate numbers going forward to achieve those outcomes. Okay. Um, okay. I have some youth questions. It may take us more than the sixty seconds, but I'm probably asking questions that everyone will have to answer at some Say point. Say youth youth questions. Uh, the the youth centers for 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 less than a million dollars. We're going to add new youth centers. We have 12 FTEs. Uh, we got a lot going on here for $900,000. I'm very impressed. So it, it says uh, uh, 12 FTEs. Is that all this year, and is it spread across just the new centers, or the or the 10 over three years? So through the through the chair, it's 10 over three years. And I, I should okay. say this plan, uh, the one that is in this year's budget. Uh, replicates a plan that we implemented several years ago on the first 10 enhanced youth centers that we did. We've updated the budget numbers, you know, based on inflation, and we've based them on a not model that is currently operating and works well. Uh, so we are pretty confident in the numbers and the staffing structures that we've put forward that they can advance this program appropriately. 
Okay, just based just on one the existing more program that we have, it'll take me over. Um, so, the, but the other thing that will happen this year, we will finally get back the youth strategy review, and and it was told to go broad. So, well, well, we well we're we're happy when we go in there and we see happy youth and we see youth in that space that should be in that space, and that's great. If the youth strategy review recommends any change. Um, or, or any add-on. There's no real flex in there for this. At that point, we would kind of have to, st we would have to look at the 10 new centers over three years and, and, and re-examine then. So would, is that work already being discussed? So through the chair, we are embedded with the, the team in social development and finance around the youth strategy. So all of these items, program options, and considerations are being discussed broadly. I'm looking at Chris right now if she wants to add, but uh, you know the, the youth centers and the implementation of these additional youth centers in our discussions to date fit very well with the strategy and considerations that are moving okay. forward. It does, to your point, because it's a three-year implementation strategy, if it needs to pivot, I think we have you know, built in some flexibility around how, how, to, how to do that pivot. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chair. Councillor McKelvey. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I just want to talk about the ravine strategy numbers um, now that the report is out. Um, I know that going forward you're looking at about 2.5 million for litter and invasive species additional in 2021. Can you just confirm the amount for 2020? That could be added um, to, so you could ramp up to. Right, so through the chair, the, the strategy and the report going forward to executive committee next week does not have any recommendations for any funding in 2020. Uh, all of the, the funding recommendations in the report, report start in 2021. Uh, so that, that has been the staff recommendations. There has been some other discussion uh, politically, not through staff, around advancing some of those items uh, earlier into the 2020 budget. So should they be advanced, what is your, do you have capacity to spend to advance these? Th through the chair, we do. Uh, we can. We can pivot the program, especially on the operating piece, as quickly as, as we need to. Uh, as I've indicated in a couple of discussions, these are seasonal positions that can be advanced through a larger hiring pool. Uh, so there are some considerations if it is council's desire for us to speed up the implementation of it. And specifically, then, you could advance litter and invasive species if additional funds are made available to you? Through the chair, certainly we could. Um, on the invasive species piece, uh, you know, it might be a slower implementation in 2020, a partial implementation in 2020. But certainly on the litter pickup, which is largely a seasonal item from April until October, uh, that would be something that would, we could implement with little effort in, in 2020. And on the capital side, um, can you confirm now through the ravine strategy, what is the unfunded capital requirement for the next 10 years? So through, through, through the chair, the unfunded uh, capital piece, and as noted in the strategy, is there is a lot that is funded already in the, in the city's uh, overall capital budget, approximately $450 million, I believe. Uh, there remains, through the strategy, uh, the strategy's recommendations, $104.5 million of unfunded capital items in the 10 priority investment areas that the Ravine strategy identifies. Over the next 10 years? Over the next 10 years. And roughly over the next five years, is it approximately $61.5 million, uh, $61 million? It, it, sure, yeah, half that and half and minus? reasonable. Okay. Um, and then my last question is, now that you've gone through this Ravine exercise, you've pulled all the different departments together um, that need to be at the table, you've looked for efficiencies, have you been able to look at that in a dollar value, what sort of savings you're able to achieve now that you're looking at the Ravines in a holistic way? So for example, if you're going into an area, you are doing the green infrastructure upgrades as along with the litter cleanup, along with the invasive species, like there is... Um, there is savings to be had there, but have you put a dollar value on that so we could see what the return on investment is? Through the chair, is? it's a great question. I, I think there's an, uh, that work has not do, been done to a level of detail yet. I think on a go-forward basis, once we put the coordinating unit in place, that will certainly be one of the things that we begin to track, as well as the increased uh, value and return on investment and the environmental outcomes that we're achieving through that approach as well. So uh, uh, no, uh, you know, specifically in the report, but certainly yes as an outcome and a goal of what we want to achieve moving forward. And then my final question is, just so it's, it's confirmed on the record, the current valuation of the ecosystem services that um, you've now um, calculated through this work is $822 million annually? That's correct. And then do you look at that as um, 
uh, are you going to be reevaluating that on an annual basis so we can see that as we invest, that value is going up? Should the chair, yes, definitely we will, and that will be one of the significant metrics that we track along the strategy's implementation. Okay, thank you, and congratulations on release of the implementation report. I enjoyed reading it. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Nunziata. Yes, uh, thank you. I uh, have two questions. Um, is there is there money in the budget? Um, the York Memorial, as you know, we had that fire at York Memorial School last year, and we have the Centennial Center next door where we have the pool, and, and we had youth drop-ins. Is um, is there money in the budget to do renovations to that? Through, through the chair, the York Memorial uh, item, I believe, is an insurance claim. So yes, there is there is uh, you know the appropriate amount uh, in the, in the budget to respond to whatever needs to be done. So. This is the pool at York Memorial you're yeah, talking right. about. Yeah, where we had the youth drop-ins. That's and, correct. Um, so the uh, so the schools and uh, so the insurance claim will be pay, uh, for the renovation. That's correct. I'm just looking to Daniel to confirm. Is that the case? Yes. Yeah, sorry. So yes. yes. So where where are we at that then? We can I, we can take it offline. We can get you. A, uh, you know, it's these are these claims are coordinated through the insurance company. This one is also being coordinated with the school board because it's you know it's a joint property. So uh, we can give you a full update on that. I don't have the specific details on it. So it would be part of the in, um, the insurance from the school. Two separate insurance. Two the separate city has insurance? a claim. The school board has a claim at the same time. Oh, okay. Um, all right. I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Um, now, I, I want to talk about tree pruning. Um, so, uh, at the audit committee uh, a few months ago, and there were some recommendations uh, that were brought forward by the Auditor General on uh, tree pruning and also uh, the time, uh, how, how long it takes for uh, when a request comes in for tree pruning. We've been telling our constituent it takes a year or more. Um, so can you tell us what the can you tell me what the status is of the recommendations from the Auditor General on that were brought forward on the issues we were having with tree pruning and tree maintenance? So through the through the chair, we are uh, reporting back through audit committee. Uh, I believe in the next few months on the status of of many of those recommendations. This budget does have an additional, I believe, two hundred thousand dollars in it. Uh, to start responding to some of the resource issues that we had around the audit that will resolve some of those issues as well. Um, so in specific to tree pruning, we are working on the auditor's recommendations as well as working with the vendors that we currently have in place. Uh, some of those conversations are not yet public, but as soon as they are available, we will be reporting out on them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from members? Uh, just a quick question um, with regard to Cabotstown Youth Center. The City Council sent a uh, request to look at potential um, emergency uh, funds for this center. I don't know. I haven't seen the report. I'm just curious where, when that's coming through. I'm sorry. Which which center? Cabotstown Youth Center. Cabotstown Youth Center is not owned by the city. It, it's uh, it's a separate entity that we've uh, you know our funding has never yeah. been allocated towards Cabotstown Youth Center. I'm actually I'm looking to Denise. Uh, I, I, reckon, funding, I recognize that again, but yeah. I, I do recall there was a member's motion and the report was going to be coming through budget. I'm just curious when I would be seeing or we would be seeing that. You will re be receiving the report back at the budget wrap up wrap up meeting on January 20th. So that'll that'll be prior to budget wrap up. We'll have the opportunity to. That's do right. That. Okay, I just want to make sure on that. Okay. Council Bradford, you had some questions? Thanks. Uh, thanks very much to the chair. Um, we've been talking a lot about the impacts of Bill 108 uh, over our discussions, and um, I recognize that page four, we're discussing this as one of the key challenges and risk. Um, absent the new regulations for um, how we're gonna secure parkland and secure the, those finances, uh, can you briefly just explain what, how that uncertainty is having a budget impact and how we're contemplating that going forward? So through, through the chair, um, as, as, as you know, a large portion of our, our uh, capital budget, especially for new enhanced and growth related items, are funded through uh, various development reserves in the current regime of Section 42 and 45 and Section 37. And the new community benefit will combine all of those things together into one. 
the 10-year plan that you have before you does uh, represent um, the plan that we put forward based on the implementation of Bill 108 being cost neutral to us. So, uh, so that the funds that we were receiving through all of those different funding sources uh, continued. Uh, until the regulations for Bill 108 are known, we will not know the full impact of, of what that impact might be on the 10-year uh, capital plan. Uh, I believe it's over $700 million over 10 years that will be dependent on, on those sources of funding, and we will be looking to replace those funds within the budget to move forward. Alternatively, we'll have to be adjusting the 10-year capital plan based on the funds that the new regulations bring forward. So that's why it's identified as a risk. That's right correct. Now. We don't know. Yeah. So it, right now, it's premised on cost neutrality in a 30, uh, 37, 42, 45 regime, yep. status quo, even though we are and development to charges. and we don't know. Yeah, including okay. development charges. So accurately identified as a risk at this point. That's correct. Okay. Yep. Um, picking up on that, uh, we've got $177 million for parkland acquisition uh, in the budget, which is great. Um, but the 10-year... Capital plan, it's at 224.7 million. Um, so we're seeing a lot right now, but over 10 years, it's less. Well, it's, it's, it is so th through the chair, it's front loaded right now. I'm going to ask Anne Marie to correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, uh, which I might be, but um, my understanding is through the new regulations, we actually have to account for how we are going to spend our, the, the reserves that we have in parkland acquisition. In past years, um, we would bring those funds forward as projects were identified, right. rather than putting them in various years of the budget. So what we've done in this budget uh, in a, uh, you know, to try and demonstrate the, the use and the spending of those funds is actually allocate them in various reserves towards the projects that we know may be forthcoming. So, you know, those, those funds, of course, may change and those lines may change based on, um, you know, the, some projects going forward, the pace of when projects uh, go forward, and the affordability of, of the various acquisitions, uh, you know, that we want to pursue. Does that answer your question? Uh, basically, I, I'm seeing a lot of money right now, but in a 10-year horizon, like it's 56% of what's contemplated in that 10 year horizon is like immediately up front here. I, I think the, the, the quickest answer is this is what we know right now. Okay. And as things change, more of those funds may, may be available. Basically, the, so the 224, um, there's two components of it. There was already 47 million in our previous capital plan, the 2019 plan. The 177 reflects what was in our reserves. So we fully, have, we fully allocated the reserves over basically uh, nine years. Um, we did not project any increase in terms of the parkland land acquisition piece because we basically put in uh, our placeholder through the, um, through the, the other, uh, the CBC component of our budget um, to reflect that. Once we get the regulation, we'll be able to better project what we will receive. Okay. Okay, um, just watching the clock, thank you, that's helpful. Uh, on a more local note, uh, specifically with capital, um, page 31, funding 20 for 2023 and 2024, Glad Hill Park Splash Pad. Um, I'm just curious what the, like a, what the lifespan is of a splash pad, because we've got 50K in, 20, uh, page 31, 50K in 2023 and 600,000 in 2024. And I was just wondering, is that based on design consultation in 2023 and then construction in 2024? Are you, are you asking the lifespan of how long it takes to build it or how long it lasts after? How long it lasts? How long it lasts? It could be 10, 15 years. I mean, uh, you know, there's all kinds of considerations around, you know, the erosion and, and concrete and, you know, and different things around the basis and the, and the amount of use. But once they're installed with the appropriate maintenance and changing valves and the rest of it, they can last right. for you know, many, many years. And that funding breakdown is consultation 2023, construction 2024. That's correct. Okay. And that's a standard approach around how we, we would do these, uh, these projects. That's great. Thanks very much, all my questions. Appreciate the hard work. Thank you. Okay, next, well, thank you very much um, for those answers. Next, we'll go on to Shelter Support and Housing Administration. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Um, page two of the analyst notes, under the goals and metrics, the 
comparing the 20, 2018 to 2019, it seems that we're projecting to have housed less people for, from shelters than from the central waiting list in 2019. Can we explain for the decrease in the actuals? Uh, through the chair. Um, yes, we have a new housing uh, allowance program that we're implementing, and so it's allowing for a ramp up over time. Um, we're also projecting some additional pressure from the ongoing vacancy uh, rate and uh, cost of housing in Toronto, that it, in fact it might slow the flow of people moving into housing. S sorry, but what accounts for the decrease in the number of people housed and the increasing households on the wait list? Well, the, the decrease in the people housed would be the reasons I discussed. The increase of people on the wait list um, would be our ongoing efforts to ensure that people who are eligible to be on the wait list are in fact put on the wait list. So we're doing a lot more outreach to our shelters and drop-in programs to ensure that they are putting people on the wait list as soon as uh, we make contact with them. So the new housing allowance program hasn't rolled out as quickly as we would have wanted? Um, it is up and running now, um, but we are, it is connected to our coordinated access uh, program, which we're implementing over, over this year. Um, but we are targeting 100 housing allowances uh, every month through that program. And then, so the 2020 target is actually under the 2018 actuals. Has something changed in that, in that amount of time that isn't gonna allow us to sort of constantly improve it? I think we're just acting in the abundance of caution, Councillor, and trying to be realistic uh, with the way that the housing market is now, um, that we're gonna face some um, pretty big uphill pressures in moving people into uh, market housing. Is there any recommendation you can make for how we can try to address that? Um, well, we'll be working with the Housing Secretariat, uh, the development of new affordable housing. Um, we are making some improvements and changes as a result of the two audits that we've had on the implementation of our centralized waitlist solution and also on the use of our uh, rent gear to income uh, units. Okay. The, um, the federal funding request um, of 76,000, what happens if we don't, uh, 76 million, what happens if we don't get it? So we will work uh, with across the corporation to uh, look for ways to fund that, uh, that gap. Um, at this point, there is no plan on reducing the service equivalent uh, to that uh, service requirement. But will that be the only option if they don't give us the 76 million that we've requested? No, we would look for uh, corporate support with our reserve funds to cover that amount. But it is uh, very important that you know the federal government participate and be a partnership in that expense. Given that the federal government didn't didn't give us the money for all of the gun violence programs that we requested, I think that it's a very real possibility that it's, they're going to come up short in this regard. Um, so I think a contingency plan is is would be. Uh, well advised. Um, can you explain? There's a second bullet point under the federal funding um, federal funding changes header on page nine. I just don't understand it, and so I just need some some clarity about what what in fact it means. Councillor, are you referring to the refugee? The second bullet. Yes. So the second bullet, we if you recall, we. Um, SSHA was successful in get, getting federal funding that we um, enabled Durham, Peel, and Hamilton uh, to be able to house some of, our, some of the refugees. The challenge is in finding housing strictly in Toronto with the housing market, so we engaged with the regions to see who would be willing to participate, and the federal, gov federal government provided funding for us to be able to uh, work with those municipalities and how some of the refugees that are willing to go to those um, areas to um, get housed. So were, was this part of a request that we made last year or is, was that something new? Um, 
So through the chair, yes, we made a request um, okay. for money for a regional uh, response to support people to move out of uh, Toronto. We received $17 million. Because of the difference in the fiscal years between the City of Toronto and the provincial government, um, we can continue to spend that money through to the end of March. And so the $6 million uh, represents the portion of that 17 that will be spent in 2020. And does that money run out? Like uh, yes, there is no commitment to that money beyond March 31st. Have we asked for more money as part of the 77 million? Um, that is not included in the 77 million. That is a separate ask to maintain a regional program. Okay, thank you. Um, EC 7.10 requested a business case for the expansion of the eviction prevention program, um, and it was to be included in the 2020 base budget submission, but it's listed as a new and enhanced not included in the report. Is, has a business case been done and, and what would the impacts of these programs be? Uh, Council, yes, we did, uh, we did do a business case and we looked at uh, those opportunities. Um, the 2020 budget focuses on stabilizing our services and preserving our service levels. Um, we did feel we needed to focus on the areas of highest vulnerability and also on supporting increased housing opportunities. Given the unfunded gap that we had, uh, we didn't feel at this point that we could make new uh, requests beyond that. Then may maybe someone can explain then what EC 7.10 said if it didn't say that, it said be included in the 2020 base budget submission, didn't it? Because then we're getting even more confused about how, how can cancel, council write things and motions that are to be included in the budget rather than us having to have two fights on every front, on, on every. That, that's file. your last question. Okay. Uh, through the chair, uh, we'll, we'll have to review the wording of the motion and, and come back and talk to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Bradford? Uh, just a couple quick <clears throat> questions. Um, so through the TTC, we're all very supportive of the recommendations from the Ombudsman. Um, that are leading to the adoption of an anti-black racism strategy. Um, could you clarify how the TTC's adoption of this strategy fits into our, our wider strategy here of the city? Through the chair, that's, that's for social development, finance, and administration. Come on, Brent. That's, that program. We're not there yet. Save that question. I'll be back to that. <coughs> okay. With shelter support. I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the 77 million that we're looking for this year, are you gonna turn it into a multi-year ask so that we're not doing this year over year and not dealing with this as a Band-Aid solution but rather a more strategic approach? Uh, yes, Councillor. As, uh, as DCM Carboni referenced, uh, we feel that this is the new norm, that these are the level of um, refugee asylum claimants that we can expect in the City of Toronto for the foreseeable future. So we are asking for ongoing and sustained funding commitment from the federal government. Okay. No other questions? Okay, next is uh, court services. Go once. Oh, here we go. Always, in a, always a question. Um, my question oh, is, uh, what is the total amount of provincial funding that we receive for court services? Uh, Councillor, court services does not receive any provincial funding. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, next is, uh, so that's it. Oh, sorry, Councillor Layton. No, 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 sorry, I was We're on to the next. getting excited about the next item. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can feel that excitement. Sorry, I'm sorry. Senior Services Long-Term Care, the excited Mike Layton would love to ask questions. Thank you very much. Um, there's a slight decrease in the, in the long-term care budget. What, what, how do we account for this? Is it a loss in provincial funding? Uh, through the chair, I'm sorry, what are you referring to, Councillor? I have a decrease in the long-term care homes budget listed here. Sorry, I'll pull up the briefing note in a second, but... Through the chair, uh, the budget is actually going up by 1.3 million net, and uh, by about 0.3 uh, 
uh, percent gross. Sorry. And the increases are associated with uh, COLA, but also the implementation of the initial emotion centered model of care pilot at Lakeshore Lodge. Okay, I'm not sure why my notes here say that. Okay, Councilor, thank you. I'm not as excited now to. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, darn. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we'll go on to the last uh, social development, finance, and administration. And Councillor Bradford, I think you had a question. Right. Uh, so let me just pull those notes back up now. Uh, so it, it's on the TTC, uh, the anti-black uh, racism strategy, and how that's fitting in with uh, with our broader strategies here in the city. The, as part of the larger um, Confronting Anti-Black Racism Action Plan, there is a commitment to um, for uh, training of uh, staff in the TTC, the police, as well as um, the City of Toronto, as well as for us to provide advice, counsel, and support um, towards um, changing improvements in um, how the TTC change, uh, does training, recruitment, um, and service delivery. So, sorry, there was a bit of noise here. Are we, is the city, is, are we working with the TTC uh, to help administer that, or are they doing that separately? We're providing advice and support to the TTC for them to administer their budget allocation. Right, okay, so they're administering the program, but we are advising on that. That is correct. Okay, um, thank you. Um, 10 cent fare increase this year um, proposed um, that will go towards, and, and in 2020 we're contemplating uh, implementing phase two and three of fare pass program, um, which in some cases is is intended to mitigate the impact of those fare increases on low-income residents. Um, criticism or challenge of the program has been, um, you know, not implementing it fast enough. Um, can you describe the phasing, how the phasing schedule has changed over the life of the program and where we will be by the end of 2020? Through the chair, um, the Fair Pass program has implemented um, phase one, which applied to um, low-income residents receiving um, Ontario Works and ODSB. Um, in this September uh, 2019, we expanded to phase two of the program, which um, uh, applies to residents who are in receipt of um, childcare subsidies. And then phase three is what the next um, rollout will look like. That will include all low-income residents who um, meet the um, low-income measure plus 15%. Um, that's an anticipated 370,000 um, eligible Torontonians. We expect about 110 of them will, um, thousand will want to take advantage of the program based on past experience. Uh, so we are keeping on track with what we what we originally planned the rollout to be. Uh, there has been some challenges in um, thinking about and planning for uh, phase three, but the resources that are a part of the budget is to allow us to have the development supports to be ready for uh, an April 2021 implementation of phase three. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. I go to Councillor Wong Tam. She just came in. I know she had a question. Then we'll continue with the uh, committee members. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the indulgence. Uh, with respect to the uh, the component that's not uh, included in the budget, and that's sp specifically the Regent Park Social Development um, uh, Plan and and the, and the budgetary requirements there. Uh, we learned that the Economic Community Development Meeting that we were that this was a vital piece of the Regent Park revitalization. There was, it was about investing in people, not just in the building. Um, but right now, as it sits in this budget that's recommended by staff, that vital piece to the success of revitalization is not included. Uh, is there a reason why staff decided not to include that? Staff submitted a business case as directed um, by committee and council with a request of 635,000 to improve um, performance in social and economic development areas of the plan. Um, there is certainly, uh, from an SDF, SDFA perspective, we continue to um, believe that that investment is important, but at this time it is not part of the recommended budget. 
And the city's involvement with the Regent Park revitalization began largely in 2007, is that not correct? Yes, correct. And so during that time between 2007 and 2020, um, what has SDFA's involvement been with the, with the social development plan and strategy? SDFA's role is to um, first provide coordination of um, all the city interests uh, to support the social development plan. It is um, also in line with our mandate to ensure that community engagement um, and the community services, um, both community-led and city-led, are um, accurately um, and effectively part of the social development plan and the revitalization process. And will you be able to do any of that work and to fulfill the, the, the mandate and the objectives and the outcomes of the social development plan without this in injection of funding? Without the uh, additional funding, it will be very uh, difficult to advance the refresh social development plan. So if without the funding, it's difficult to advance the, the outcomes of that plan, but can it be done? Can you do this work without any staff in the field, on the ground, in the community, coordinating the, the city's interests and aligning it with the mandate of revitalization? How do we do this without staff? Um, it would be very difficult to do. Um, and on, t on top of um, it would be very challenging to do, we do have community partners uh, who have pledged um, resources to support the plan in concert with the city. So without a city contribution, uh, those outcomes will also be limited. We won't be able to leverage effectively those external partnership funds. Recognizing that revitalization of Regent Park sort of sets the tone for the bigger campus revitalizations at Lawrence Heights and Alexander Park. Um, if if the, if the funding is not advanced in this particular budget cycle, uh, and we're heading into phases four and five, uh, is it, um, will we be setting up a, a, a particular narrative that the City of Toronto is interested in investing in buildings and facilities, but not necessarily the, the people, in, including creating pathways for education, pathways for uh, in career advancement, pathway for job skill development, pathways out of poverty, and pathways into uh, a workplace uh, workforce um, to reduce community violence. Like, how do we how do we ensure that Regent Park is successful, so that Alexander Park and Lawrence Heights is equally successful? If this is the first one. So, as you know, Councillor, um, in those other revi revitalization situations, their uh, community are looking to Regent Park as the first and. Um, uh, example uh, to learn from. So certainly our inability to effectively support community engagement and the delivery of the social development plan will be um, a, a cautious lesson perhaps for um, the other revitalization. And, and just to be clear, a yes or no answer would be helpful. Is it the city's responsibility to ensure the success of the revitalization? The city is a partner, absolutely. Okay. Um, a question regarding the Cabbage Town Youth Center. Uh, there was a motion that I had tabled to specifically report back out through the budget process on the feasibility of the city stepping in to, uh, to provide some supports, even if it's an interim measure to uh, help financially float uh, what is a critical recreation facility in the middle of the city for low-income families and, and children. Um, I don't think I've seen that briefing note or report come back. When can we anticipate that? The chair has already asked that question, so it's good to know you're in sync. Um, the briefing note will be ready in um, preparation for the budget wrap-up meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Next, are there questions on this division? My Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Th that was one of the programs around reducing uh, violence. Are there any other, any other elements of the July 2018 immediate steps to reducing gun violence report that remain unfunded. So through that um, report, there was a suite of initiatives that um, SDFA um, advanced, including um, uh, 20, $32 million of applications to the federal government. 
while some of the initiatives, um, the ones that are most ready and staff deem are impactful are funded within uh, the new and enhanced. There are other initiatives that absolutely could be funded communities uh, with federal par uh, participation. We all know that community safety is complex um, and involves structural issues related to social and economic inclusion and inequity. And so there is always need for more resources um, to advance and support uh, achieving community safety, but the city cannot do that on, on its own. Can you list the other programs that are going unfunded, even if they were requests to the provincial government? The most, I, I think the most impactful thing for me to do would be to provide it in a briefing note if that is of your... I think I neglected you to ask that, right and now. I asked for a lot of briefing notes, so oh, sure. you might get, you, you, you might sure. be lucky, you don't have to write that one now. But we can ask, we can, we can chat offline and maybe you can give me the list if it's sure. not too much trouble to get nope, to. Not a Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay thank, you, thank you, appreciate that. Um, are there any other questions on this um, division? Seeing none, I want to thank you. First of all, I just want to thank everybody from community and social services, all the staff who have worked incredibly hard to pull all this together. Um, a lot of great work, and just want to thank everybody. Um, our next... I did, I asked for I, any more I'm very questions. sorry, I'm very sorry. We, we were just having a little chat. I'm sorry I missed that, but I do have questions. I, 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 guess, I guess we can allow you to... Uh... Yes, I was talking, which is what I just said, okay. and I apologize okay. for it at the well, time. Thank okay, you. Okay, go ahead. Um, uh, the anti-black racism training, uh, we're talking just 155,000. Uh, Councillor Bradford was asking you about uh, does it partnership. Are we monitoring uh, the efficacy of us just advising them and their programs, both police and, and TTC? Part of the new and enhanced... Oh. A, a for realsies fire alarm? There'll be an announcement. Does everyone remember the emergency drills? Lights down. Hold that question. What's that? Is that planning and housing or TUICC? That we were in? Yeah. When it was, was uh, planning and housing. Yeah. Yeah. When we were locked down? Yeah. <laughs> we, we can just hold for an announcement on, on what to do. They usually announce. Yeah, tell us what to do. This is the longest they've ever gone without telling us. So curious. Um, I'm, I'm just, just, I'm going to work, I'm going to call a 20 minute recess. Um, we only have questions left, I think, Councillor Carroll and SDFA. Um, so I don't think we need any of the, no, we're going to do TTC. The, we're going to still, we're working at noon. We're going to try to do it for noon. So let's take a 20 minute recess. 
um, right now, just so we can go. So 20 minute recess, back in 20 minutes, and um, we'll go from there. No, we were gonna try to do it. Thank you. 
Can I have all councillors come back to the uh, budget meeting, please? We're about to resume. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting back to order, please. If everybody can please grab their seats so we can begin the meeting. We are just finishing up social development, finance and administration, and prior to the uh, false alarm, we were asking questions, and I believe Councillor Carroll um, did have the floor for questions, so I don't know if you'd start it. I'll just start your time again at five minutes, uh, Councillor. Okay. And, um, and you will be happy to know I got as many of them answered offline as I could while Perfect. we were standing around. If we around. can have everybody at the back of the room, please be quiet or have grab their seats. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so uh, the uh, well, for, well, the, the simple question uh, grants the community investment uh, grant program. Uh, are they getting a cost of living increase to to the envelope? Yes, uh, the cost of living increase is part of the base budget this year. Okay, so, so they've got a 2.1% to the envelope and how they allocate it is up to the process. Yes. Awesome, okay. Um, uh, in, in the, we, we were talking about the, uh, the, the phase three of the, the Fair Pass program. Within the funding that you have there, is there a promotion program? Because now if we move to the, the low-income resident who's at, at low-income measure plus 15%, um, captured in that are some of the people uh, who may be working, uh, fit into that nevertheless, but, but are proud of the fact that they, that they don't access any subsidy programs. How do we get to them and, and make sure that they, uh, that they take advantage of this? Uh, will TTC help us with that, or how are we doing it? There's not a specific line item um, related to communications. Um, so I think that that is something that we'll have to do as we refine the ask for 2021. Oh, so you'll track how many reach out to take up and then, and then, uh, then, then move from there. We do that already, but absolutely. And we love the support of TTC for outreach and uh, advertising, if they'd like to provide that. Okay. And uh, um, the, on page 27 are the, the, uh, the items that are, that are not included in the budget, but there's, the business cases are not there, which is kind of, uh, uh, it's sort of inconsistent. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not in the, the new and enhanced not included. Um, how do we know what we're missing if we don't have the business case for what we're not including? Well, through the chair, we could provide more detail through a briefing note if that's what committee would like. It, well, I, I don't want to generate, we've already asked questions and, and most of the committee members here know what those programs are, but I would love it to be a more consistent thing. If it's not included, I'd still like to have the blurb that goes with the numbers. So that, so that people know how we, we chose what we did include and didn't include. Uh, just a, a format uh, uh, issue for later. And I had one other thing. Oh, I, th I believe actually someone has submitted a briefing note for this. Uh, so they may have missed your explanation at launch. And I wonder if you could just quickly explain again, the 11 positions cut are not a concern for you and that is because? The 11 positions were part of the $32 um, million dollars of applications to the federal government um, to support... Uh, in 2019. In 2019. Yeah. They were not filled positions because we were waiting for um, uh, a positive um, federal f uh, review on our funding applications from the federal government. Okay. Yes. Okay. One other question, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we have a program in here to enhance the CCRP program. 
um, uh, uh, federally. Um, I'm just wondering about the health of that division if that doesn't come through because, you know, sadly we've had a huge amount of need for it this year. It, the, it has grown to the point where the person who was responding to crises in my area was not well by the end of the year from overwork and, and then we had another incident, a really tragic random shooting. Um, so what are we doing to, to respond to the, the growth in demand if there is one? And we don't have time to go to the feds and say we need some dollars. Is there some flex in your budget that we can, we can backfill and help crisis response when they need to? Um, there is an intention uh, to backstop that program through reserve funding um, if we don't receive uh, investments from the federal government. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your indulgence. Thank you very much. Um, and again, thanks to all the staff uh, from that uh, um, section. Um, we are now ready to go on to the TTC. Uh, members, I'm, I've just spoken with them. They have about a 15 to 20 minute presentation, so I'm going to suggest that we actually work, if we have to go a little bit after 12.30 so we can get the TTC done. Um, we'll take it. We do need an hour break, unfortunately, to deal with a lot of the uh, briefing note requests. We'll come back after lunch, and that will probably be the only thing on the agenda if that works for everybody. So um, I just want to extend the meeting past 12.30 recess to complete the presentation of the TTC. All in favor? That's carried. Welcome, uh, everyone from the TTC. So you're you're up just before lunch break. So we'll let you uh, uh, use your time accordingly. Welcome. I just want to introduce yourself. We all know you, but I think everybody else would like to know who's at the table, and then you can begin. Good morning. I'm Rick Leary. I'm the CEO of the TTC. And I'm Josie Levita, interim CFO at the TTC. Uh, Mark Delvecchio, Capital Budget Coordinator. Excellent. It's all yours. Thank you very much through you, Chair. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members of the Budget Committee, as well as colleagues. I'm pleased to present the TTC's 2020 Operating Budget and 10-Year Capital Plan for your consideration. I would like to thank Josie Levita, who joined us at the TTC this past July. While this is uh, her first budget as the, with the TTC, this does represent her third budget uh, with myself in collaboration. For 2020, she has helped the TTC align its operating requirements on achieving our outcomes and has recalibrated our 10-year capital plan to focus on establishing a steady state program that ensures we are addressing our critical capital work to support our service delivery that is achievable within the available funding. And on that note, I would like to emphasize that we at the TTC are extremely cognizant of the fiscal challenges facing the city and competing service priorities it must address. We greatly appreciate the funding support that it has been provided to us, especially on the capital side this year, so thank you for that. We also understand that there are continued fiscal challenges ahead of us. We want to assure you that we're also doing our part by working smarter, more efficiently and effectively with the money that we receive and that is focused on meeting outcomes. These would include being an efficient system to achieve fiscal sustainability, providing seamlessness and reliable service to ensure customer satisfaction, being an inclusive and accessible organization and service provider while preparing for future demand to ensure system resiliency to keep people moving. I would like to take a moment and share a number of uh, our achievements, if I could. Um, you know, previous investments uh, in service improvements have resulted in a number of following things. We are meeting or exceeding targets on getting the service that we advertise onto the street every day. We're more flexible to respond to service disruptions. And last year, we had a reduction in our operator overtime of 21%, or approximately $7 million. 
we're adding over 120,000 service hours or 120 op 21 operators to maintain and improve our service. A five-year service plan will guide our service to improve for improvements over the next five years. As for customer satisfaction, it's on the increase. Our last survey was up one point to 81 percent. We're now reviewing our non-core operations and examining how do we do business differently while respecting the great people who serve the TTC in this city. We have $31 million in efficiencies and budget reductions included in this budget, and future benefits will be realized as we undertake a comprehensive business transformation program to identify opportunities over the next few years. We're collaborating with key city partners and have leveraged shared service opportunities with IT and purchasing, and more. there are more to come. We're modernizing and transforming our core corporate capacity functions and continuing with best practices. Work is also underway in the following. We're transforming our materials, procurement, and finance functions. We continue to mature our approach when it comes to commercial management, and we're maturing our project delivery pro, um, practices and refining our stage gating and priority setting processes. Advancing our asset management and integrating it with the capital planning and budgeting, as well as our capital investment plan. We are taking action on protecting our revenue base with the development of various strategies uh, using data-driven approach. To that end, we have uh, requested 50 additional constables for a strategic appointment. We're deeply committed to ensuring that the TTC is an inclusive and accessible organization and service provider. We're implementing an anti-racism strategy in collaboration with the city, as well as establishing an independent complaint, complaints office. And finally, we need to prepare for the future to keep pace with the service demand and expansion of transit within the city and the transit network. Even with all our efforts, I am still concerned, to be honest with you, about our collective ability of our costs and funding structure to keep pace with the demand for service and associated infrastructure to keep Toronto moving. So with that, I thank you for allowing me to have opening remarks. I'll turn it over to Joseph Vita for presentation. Okay, thank you, Rick. Good morning, all. Uh, I guess it's just about good afternoon. So I will be your guide um, in uh, providing you with an overview and highlights of the TTC's 2020 operating budget and the 10-year capital plan. Uh, for some committee members who are on the TTC board, the capital plan that you will see today is different than what the board actually approved, and we'll be talking about that. Next slide. As you know, the TTC uh, is here to help uh, keep people moving by providing friendly, safe and effective uh, transit services to everyone that lives, works and visits Toronto. And we also play a critical role in supporting the city's social, economic and environmental objectives and ensuring that uh, we are improving mobility. Slide. So what do we do? We have two services. We, pro we provide reliable transit service that draws on its high standards, customer care, uh, and uh, draws from our rich traditions of safety, service, and courtesy. Two services, conventional service that provides 9.6 million service hours, 254 million service kilometers annually, and a wheel trans service that provides door-to-door -door accessible transit for passengers with any disability. We also manage and maintain an, an infrastructure and fleet that helps support those services 24 hours per day, seven days a week, and for 2020, a projected 533.5 million riders. So as an entity, this TTC has established service objectives to, to achieve four key outcomes. And these are guiding us in 2020, but also will continue to guide us uh, through the term of council. And we've used these four uh, to help allocate our resources uh, so that they are focused on achieving those outcomes. I believe Rick has uh, identified them, so I will not uh, repeat them, so we can keep going. All right. So what are some of the key uh, service issues that are facing the TTC? I can go through each of these, and I think you've heard them uh, as we're trying to deal with service demand, trying to preserve service levels and dealing with our cost structure to accommodate that. Uh, also focusing on our revenue protection and making sure that our infrastructure and funding is keeping pace with all of that. But I think the collective issue that uh, we would like uh, to leave this committee with 
is that ability for our cost and funding structure to A, preserve the service gains that we've made, and B, keep pace with the current and future service demands and growth that's coming. So I'd just like to spend a few minutes to explore that issue a little bit uh, deeper. So um, we've seen a lot of improvements uh, to, made to the TTC, particularly in the last term of council. A lot of them are on this slide uh, for you to recall. In 18 and 19 alone, there was over $30 million invested in ensuring that we were improving our capacity and our reliability in our service. As well, we also had uh, almost $42 million in investments made to ensure that our system is much more accessible. Adding to that sort of the presto investment that's been made, it's almost $70 million. We've seen some of the, these are some of the capacity improvements that we actually see in the network in 2018. The pink, uh, light and dark pink um, lines uh, identify where we have uh, extended our express system in the east and west. Uh, sorry, those are the green. The peak periods is in pink and the off peak is the light pink. And it's mostly in the east and west. In 2019, we made improvements throughout the entire network, and that's uh, the colors that you see there in the pink. Given these investments, we've actually seen some measurable results. We were able to deliver the service we advertise, and we've seen an increase in service reliability and, and resiliency. So our service uh, vehicles that are in service are now uh, being delivered at 100%. Our subway capacity delivery 19 performance is actually uh, showing quite uh, sound um, results. Line one, which is to the left, is exceeding our targets uh, in 2018. And line uh, two on the right has not only exceeded our 18 results, but also our 19 targets, and at many times has reached over 100%. We've also seen from these investments that there's been a significant reduction in service vehicle short turns, so a 48% reduction in our buses since June, chart to the left, and streetcars 65% reduction since May, chart to the right. As well, key investments in adding operators since uh, in the last two years has allowed us to improve our service delivery, eliminate service cancellations, and we've been able to reduce our uh, operator overtime by $7 million or 21% since April 2018. And we continue to work on new strategies to continue that downward trend. However, there's always a however. We have more work to do because on our bus system, we're seeing that our on-time service performance while improving remains below our 90% target. So in this particular budget, what we are trying, what we've ensured is that we are preserving the service that we have and that the, the new funding of 3.7 million for year one of our service plan is committed to improving those surface transit schedules. And to start, we'll be looking at improvements made on certain lines as well as additional things that'll be rolled out through the year. So while we've been reporting our ridership revenue in 2019 as being below target, our service demand is actually high. What you can see from this chart are the red bars, which actually identify vehicle boardings. They are actually on the increase. The blue, the blue bars is really our ridership revenue. Now there are reasons for why there are some adjustments to the revenue, but essentially the key point here is that ridership revenue is not keeping pace with the combined effect of service demands and cost escalation. We are seeing uh, some growth. Uh, in 2020, but we've rebaselined our revenue budget to reflect that actual experience on a new lower base. And we are also, as Rick mentioned, uh, have identified a series of fare protection initiatives. We also uh, would like to just show you that we have seen significant investment from the city in the last number of years. 40% or 216 million from 2014 or an average of 43 million per year. And this year the request uh, or the recommended amount is 26, almost 27 million, representing three and a half percent. So it's been on the uprise to deal with a lot of these service improvements, but we acknowledge that the city continues to face fiscal challenges and we will have some coming forward as well. So what are we doing about this? So we have a series of actions on how we're responding. So on the service side, a um, series of things that are being done, I'm not gonna go through each one. 
Uh, in terms of survey, uh, preserving service levels, we have a series of uh, actions that Rick highlighted some, but that's not only to deal with our readiness, but our cost structure. And this budget reflects the beginning of that with $31 million in efficiencies. We're taking actions on our revenue uh, side of the house so we can uh, continue to protect that. So there's a series of uh, efforts underway to ensure that we have strategic deployment of our enforcement staff to actually focus in on our fair evasion. And we're taking various steps around our presto and um, fair media and our stop selling of tokens that will assist with that. And finally, we have the additional transit enforcement and officers as well. On the capital side, there are a series of actions being taken. Uh, and uh, obviously the first one is the leveraging of the city building fund to, that's focused on our subway infrastructure and vehicle purchases. We have various practices to ensure that our capital project delivery is efficient and effective in being able to deliver that program. And finally, of course, whatever work that we can do with the city and our provincial and federal partners to advocate for funding uh, hopefully will help address that. So let's just uh, go over the numbers on the operating side. So for 2020, the TTC's operating budget uh, is a total uh, request that has revenues of 1.354 billion, uh, representing a $77 million or 61% change over our actuals uh, from two projected actuals for 2019 and a $57 million increase over our budget. On the expenditure side, it's 2.14 uh, billion uh, that, uh, that our total expenses um, reflect. It's 104.4 billion or 5.1 compared to actuals and 84 uh, million or 4.1 percent compared to budget, with the difference being the city funding of 27 million dollars or three and a half percent. So where does this money come from? As you can see, uh, the lion's share of this, or 59% of the funding sources to, to support this budget, comes from passenger revenue. Uh, city funding makes up 37%, and then the ancillary revenues below. In terms of that increase for 2020 of, uh, uh, to meet this budget, to balance this budget, there's sort of three specific items to the right. Our revenue protection and cost recovery actions, so that includes uh, ensuring that we have um, additional resources available. So we're hiring 50 uh, additional in, uh, enforcement officers, and that will cost about $3 million, but that is to generate $10 million of, of recovery of our revenue, so a net increase of $7 million. And we're also looking to recover funds from Metrolinx of almost $20 million. And these are for costs... Uh, for incremental bus service on Eglinton and Finch West that there is a uh, contractual obligation to fund but which they have not funded or recovered since March 2017. A 10 cent fare increase has been recommended by the board that represents 10 cents on all, um, on all fares except idle cash that stays at $3.25 and that will generate $31.4 million effective uh, March 1st. And of course, the city funding of 27 million or three and a half percent. Key cost drivers. So when we look at what's driving this budget, our expenditure increases. Uh, our expenditures are increasing by 4.7 percent, while our revenues are increasing uh, when you exclude a reserve draw by two percent. Key drivers really is inflation, our wages and our energy costs, although we've taken actions to mitigate some of those energies through hedging and shared services, preserving the service levels that we've identified, dealing with uh, some non-recurring under expenditures, and of course, $31 million in efficiencies. So here's our list of efficiencies um, that we have uh, built into this budget. So like every year, we look at our actual experience and we adjust where we can. In 2019, we had over $20 million of underspending, of which about six of it was, uh, non -re was recurring, and so we've built that into the base. We have many uh, implement uh, recommendations that we're implementing from former AG uh, recommendations, and that's providing uh, uh, savings from bus maintenance warranty, warranty recovery as and bus maintenance after uh, market part savings. 
We are reinvesting savings in our materials and procurement area uh, so we can transform that and that comes from alternate sourcing of parts. Um, some other areas that I'd like to highlight, it's the shared services. So as, as Rick mentioned, we're, we're collaborating with our, our partners and what, we, what this reflects in the seven million there is the same contract that the city has had for diesel fuel as well as some edging. Um, and so that's given us uh, some good results. On the service delivery side, that is the beginning of our business transformation program. And uh, we are looking at all our non-core uh, operations and looking at different ways to, to do business there. Just a, a last note, um, we do still have an unspecified reduction of 2.6 million. However, that's been matched against uh, 2.6 million in one-time uh, new, new requests so that will not have an impact in, in next year. So when we look at what's, uh, what new service investments are included in this budget, uh, the first year of the service plan, which is the first line, improving our service transit schedules has uh, been included here. Uh, we're looking to reduce wait times for the call centers and looking at some third party assistance on that. The next two items address uh, issues and some recommendations coming out of Ombudsman's report, and we're establishing an anti-racism uh, unit and working very closely with the city's anti-racism, uh, uh, anti-black racism unit here at the city to, to implement that at the TTC. Business transformation, which is a one-time cost, is actually an office that's being set up to deal with the program that we're laying out. And to help us prepare for the future, we're looking at our full fare structure and how we collect into the future so that we are prepared uh, moving forward. And finally, you are seeing the very beginnings of the costs associated with the preparation work to start the operation of the Eglinton Crosstown. So looking to the future, what you see here uh, for 2021 is uh, an absolute number on the on outlined here, but also what we see the change being. So it's over 100, uh, almost 102 million uh, for, for 2021. That's being forecasted another 69 million in 2022. Now this does not include COLA beyond 2000, March 2021 when our collective agreement expires. But it does reflect 64 million over two years for the opening of the Crosstown based on the current schedule of 30 million uh, for 2021 and another 34 for 2022. And that is to operate and maintain that system. We do have some growth built into our, our revenue numbers, uh, but they're based on their preliminary estimates based on our service plan. Okay, now to the 10 year capital plan. So our asset inventory was worth almost $19 billion and it's been outlined here for you. So it's quite extensive as you can see. And given that um, extensive inventory, the TTC in 2019 established, introduced its first 15 year capital investment plan, really to provide a clear view of what's required over the 15 year period, to ensure there was increased focus on state of good repair and growth uh, requirements, to provide a distinction between what's funded and what's not funded and the impact of not funding that, and of course to have a multi-year planning tool. So that's been updated. Uh, so here's an overview of what this, uh, the CIP looks like this year. It's $35 billion after a series of adjustments. And to the left, you can see that almost 50, uh, just over 50% is for line one and line two, with another 25% for vehicles. When you look at it by category, it's over, when you combine health, safety, legislated and state of good repair, it's almost 62% of, of the 15 year needs um, that have been identified in our CIP. So the portion that's funded is our 10-year capital plan. It's now $11.9 billion. That is, a number is much higher than the $7.6 billion we saw at the, team, at the board in December. So as a base program, um, what we chose to do, what we achieved to do this year was establish a steady state of good repair and maintenance program. So there were consistent numbers profiled over the 10 years so that people can plan for the future, ensure that all in-flight projects were fully funded so that they can be completed. But essentially then we added some other projects. And so overall this capital plan has almost nearly doubled based on last year's amount. 
And most of that comes from the $4.2 billion in additional funding from the City Building Fund as well as, well as a one-time increase in the federal gas tax. That has allowed us to make significant progress on previously unfunded requirements. So what have we done? So with Council's approval of the increase to the City Building Fund levy, and of course their direction to reflect that in this 2020 budget launch, our, our capital plan was adjusted from when uh, the time that the board had reviewed it. And we have incorporated key capital investment priorities uh, to, um, in accordance with the additional funding. The focus there has been on subway infrastructure because that has been where our need is, has been most great. And so we've actually allocated out that to various projects. So we've included um, line one and line two capacity enhancements as well as, well as uh, state of good repair in our SOGR basic uh, subway infrastructure program. And as well, we've added uh, the line two automatic train control. We have an additional 1.1 billion that we have allocated to the purchase of additional vehicles, but the subject of how that money will be dispersed between its various components is the subject of a report to the January 27th uh, TTC board meeting, and those decisions will be made there and transmitted back to this committee on the 28th. I must say that the while we have this split of 3.1 and 1.1, what's clear is that the automatic train control um, is something that is dependent along on our subway purchases as well. So those decisions will be put before uh, to the board. So this is last year's 10-year capital plan. And so when we look at the base program that uh, we, we brought forward this year, you can see it's been reprofiled and smoothed out with a lot of the, the things in the front being uh, finite projects that we had. To that, and what the board saw, was the addition of the Young Bloor Capacity Improvement Project, which was a pro identified as a priority project for three orders of government, and that was built into that plan. Since then, and because of the City Building Fund increase, we've added uh, an additional amount that reflects the, inf the subway infrastructure uh, values. And then finally, the last part is the allocation of the vehicle's uh, component. So in total, we've got a program that's now almost $12 billion. So when you look at uh, what that um, profiles as, this, you know, this particular chart shows on the left side what those values are, and you can see that the very large uh, left-hand corner, uh, the big blue portion of this pie, is the recoverable debt, which reflects the, the debt that we will be uh, able to issue as a result of that levy. And on the right-hand side, you can see that much of this money, or over 55%, is going to state of good repair, but it's significant 32% is going to service improvement as a result of those additions. The next couple of slides just breaks down the 10-year capital plan by, by project, and I won't go through them, and they're here for your information. And so slide 34 outlines sort of our key um, four there, with most of it being buildings and structures, and on the next slide, our capacity improvements, which are the ones we just spoke about, which are the new additions on, on slide 35. So with the need to be able to ensure that our funding actually will get spent and that uh, we're aligning our cash flows, we have recalibrated um, our 10-year capital plan. As you can see, uh, 2020 is actually lower than both uh, than the last number of years, and so we've smoothed that out as I've shown you in that profile. And the next slide just essentially identifies the extent to which you know a lot of the work is committed and we're doing more work to ensure that um, staff have the capacity and, and the tools to, to actually get the work done. So our funding uh, for this 10-year program, as I, as I mentioned, is outlined here. Most notably, of course, is the recoverable debt of $7 billion. Finally, so that's the 10-year capital plan. So when we go back to this, the capital investment plan, what does that mean for the overall 15-year period? So the portion that you're seeing now in color, it represents the funded portion of the, fifth, the, of the first 10 years of the, of the CIP. That's worth $11.9 billion. When you then add the portion that could not be funded in the first 10 years as identified, that's another $10.6 billion of unfunded. When we then look into the following five years, 
if we take the base funding, just the base funding and not the added CBF, uh, and extrapolate that into the following five years, that would give us another 2.6 billion of funding, uh, which means that the latter part that we've identified in the 10-year period is 6.4 billion that's unfunded. So in total, I have a $35 billion program, 14.5 billion is now funded, with 21 billion still unfunded over a 15-year period much better than where we were last year and definitely even where we were before the December 16th board meeting. So there still are some things that aren't funded, of course. The biggest issue, of course, being our vehicles. And so uh, part of what we've tried to do with the funding that we have allocated is the extent to which we can leverage that uh, to our greatest degree because there's still an unfunded amount. And of course, there are a series of, of facilities that need to go with all of that and streetcars and other, uh, other kind of state of good repair. So what does that do to our backlog? So this is a number you've never seen before and it is only just being placed in here to kind of deposit it. In the past, uh, there was never really an SOGR, SOGR backlog number provided for the TTC. It really reflected whatever was there was the amount that we were reducing because of our capacity to spend review. What we've done just for now is place the unfunded state of grid repair portion of the capital investment plan below the line so that we could, should keep that and track that. But this number will be refined as we continue to do our work through to the 2021 20, budget process. And with that, I conclude the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now go to questions from councillors. Outside councillors, we'll start with Councillor Longtown. Uh, yes, thank you very much. With respect to the uh, the budget that was pr proposed by the TTC board and what's actually before us, you said that there are two different set of numbers. Um, what exactly is the, the difference? Uh, so through the chair, the operating budget that the board approved is exactly the same. What is different is the capital plan that the board approved. It was, uh, and if you go to the slide that I was just on, uh, because we have since added the $4.2 billion of the additional funding. So on slide 32, there's a table in there. And so the, f the first grouping that you see, that totals $7.6 billion, that's what the board had. And then we've subsequently added projects and of course the funding to bring that up to the 11.9 billion. I see. Okay. So then is there a, the recommendation now is to amend the capital budget so that we can uh, reflect the staff report, but to the staff recommended budget, budget will it be similar to that of the TTC board recommended budget? Is so that what we're trying to do? We're align the aligning the two? Yeah, there's a, there is a step in between, and that is we had been uh, requested when the board dealt with its capital plan that we report back on accelerated vehicle procurement plan. We were doing that anyway. Now with the additional funding that didn't exist, because basically council approved it the following day, yeah. um, we will be going back with that report. We've allocated the one billion there, and then that will come back here they will amend a recommended budget. And that's what that'll, council will vote And that'll for. come back here. And that's what council will vote for? Yes. And, okay, thank you very much, that's very helpful. And with respect to the, the 50 constables um, that are gonna be hired, I guess there's sort of fair enforcement. Um, you say that it costs us, it will cost us $3 million to, to roll out that particular new program to generate $10 million of recaptured, I guess, fair loss. Is that a, is that a, is that a, a good business transaction? given all that's transpired with respect to fair enforcement the, um, and some of the interactions with the most vulnerable. Like, I'm just wondering if, if it's, it's good, if there's a decent business case to be made. So through the chair, uh, we believe that, that there is. I think that um, there's a few things that are changing. Um, so we have had uh, constables prior. We had inspectors also approved last year and now this is additional constables. Our deployment strategy is being informed by many things, including Presto data and other things to help uh, target that. But I think fundamentally there's a shift in the culture from a traditional policing model 
um, and towards a model more in security and customer service. And so part of the work that we're doing in our anti-racism strategy, as well as the independent office that's being set up, is refocusing that workforce along those lines. Because sometimes on the on the Queen line, I see like two or three enforcement officers all boarding this this, this similar streetcar, and I, I wonder if that's like how is how is that staffing level being deployed? Um, but but I'll leave it for now. The state of good repair backlog. Um, there's been so many numbers that are bantered around. It's it's a little bit confusing to know what's included and what's not. But the between 3.5, 7.8, 20.7. Uh, the true state of good repair, what does it include, what does it not include, um, and is, is, is there a reason why th there's different numbers being used all the time? So if you're referring to the different numbers being the capital investment plan, yeah. so that was a 15-year program identifying all our, all our capital needs, of which a portion of it was state of good repair. So uh, the por what we're showing as the backlog number is the amount in the first 10 years that we've identified that a state of good repair needs that has not been funded. Yeah. Okay, so, and, and then this is just a preliminary number because as you can appreciate, the addition of some of these new projects, while we call them service improvement, like the capacity improvements, there is a significant state of good repair component to it, so we'll be refining that. But this is a first attempt to kind of start capturing that information. Okay, so we'll see some additional numbers. You'll They'll be drilled down more details, more specific. Next and cycle. I, thank you. I think I have room for maybe one last question. Um, the Young and Blur capacity improvement, um, in, the, in this particular, um, in, the, in your notes, it says that you're going to be making improvements and enhancements. It's going to roll out to 2029. Um, just every every year there seems to be a, a quantum that's allocated. When will that actually be finished? So it was just placed into this 10-year capital yeah. plan this year. So it's just, the planning work is just starting and I think it's uh, intended to go through to 2029. So they're just starting the pre, like the first yeah, stage gating. So it's, but it's a 10-year process? Of yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, Councillor Layton. Um, thank you very much. Slide 41. Does that give you nightmares? Like, at, at what point, maybe I'll, I'll frame it a different way. At what point does the backlog as a percentage of an asset reach critical, in your opinion? Like that, that line climbs very dramatically after 2026. Right. From well above what or 2024, well above what we see in other divisions. Um, at, at what point do we reach critical with respect to state of good repair? So, so there, a big portion of that amount is um, vehicle procurements. So a bunch of vehicles coming offline Ones that have are coming to the end of their useful their life, life that need to be replaced. Not repaired, but completely replaced. replaced. So we have overhaul funding that we've tried to build in to manage it to certain level, to certain uh, position, uh, points in time, like our subways. There, we have funding built into this 10-year capital plan that gets us to 25 years. And, and this state of good repair is only to maintain the current service level. This doesn't include the unfunded that are on slides, slide 39, correct? Slide 39. Like that unfunded portion would be vehicle purchases to it's, improve yeah, so, service. So we've identified, but some of those facilities also have to then go with those yeah, as well. Sure. So what strategies are we currently working on to ensure that we're meeting our bus and streetcar on time performance targets of 90%? Through you, Chair. I'll, I'll handle that. Um, we've uh, implemented a, uh, we call it Vision, our computer aided dispatching system in the last two years, and we have staff that work on a weekly basis revising our schedules and tracking the movement of buses. Um, one of the things that we've reported to the board a number of times is now that we have uh, streetcar and bus fleets, all right, that are reliable. You, you saw the major reduction in short turns, for instance. We've had similar uh, cases occur when it comes to, uh, we call, follow change-offs, vehicles that are breaking down in service. So we're now starting to see a significant improvement on the on-time performance. We believe over the next two years, we'll, it'll continue to hit their mark. Um, are there, is there any specific obstacle to us achieving that 90%? Because 
quite a bit below it. Yeah, that's correct. No, there's, there, I wouldn't say it's an obstacle. We do a number of board periods, 10 or 11 board periods, we call them, where we change schedules on a regular basis based on seasonal and events happening within the city and also addressing the uh, construction within the city. So what we've, we've taught uh, staff over the last two or three years is how to use this new software, use the data to make these seasonal adjustments. So what we're starting to see is some real strides and roots. Um, how long does it take? If we were to tell you tomorrow we've got, we've got your $5 billion for additional buses, additional streetcars, and the maintenance facilities, how, how fast, when, when would the first bus or streetcar hit? I always tell people that to buy a bus, it takes about three years. If you start with an RFP and put in the package together, um, about three years with the industry delivery right now. Streetcars could be three to five years, and trains, I like to say, six to seven years. So given, given that it was explained to us that on slide 41, a lot of that state of good repair that we, we start to see three years from now, four years from now, when would we have to make that decision about purchasing additional streetcars and buses, and trains for that matter, when would we have to make that decision in order for us not to start to then have to duct tape buses back together? Right, so the, uh, when we will have in the report an identified number of buses and streetcars that we'd like to have as part of the funding that's been made available, um, it would literally over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, it becomes critical when we start looking to the future. We do know that 2026 is the date that uh, you said it would keep makes us nervous. Beyond 2026 uh, to 2027 timeframe does make us nervous. That was with the, uh, the intent of the report that was released in January of last year, just to start the conversation. Okay, thank you. Uh, just switching gears a little bit, and pardon the pun, but where's the bicycle parking? Uh, why was bicycle parking removed from the budget? I have a note here that there was some bicycle parking element that was removed from the budget. It's probably just transferred to another division. I just. As a capital project, it was completed in 2019. Oh, it was, oh so it's, yeah. it's just over. It's over. Yeah, it's completed. Uh, you have one more question. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Councillor McKelvey. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's not, I don't necessarily know if this is a question for DTC or, or for the CFO. Um, the city building fund is going to raise $6.6 .6 billion, correct? The ex through the chair, the extension to the city building fund um, is estimated to be able to support $6.6 .6 billion in capital funding. Okay, and then TTC, you've updated the capital budget and you've put an additional $4.7 billion in capital on the basis of that city building fund? So through the chair, we've added an additional $4.1 billion of city building fund. We had already had, when you, we were at the board, Councillor, the young Bloor, and it's paying for the, the city share that we didn't have that assumed, so that's $4.6 and then we have another 100, uh, almost $200 million of federal gas tax money. So 4.6. Has this entire $6.6 .6 billion been allocated through this budget? Um, through the chair, um, a very large component of the $6.6 .6 billion has been allocated through the budget. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, through the chair, um, if you remember in the budget presentation in a couple of the out years, and, and I apologize, I don't have them in front of me, there were um, dotted boxes, and and I responded to a question that was built on that, and I said, because we're moving to um, a stage gating process, we didn't have sound estimates or timing that would in actual fact be able to put those projects, but we know it's going to be allocated to transit and housing in those approximate in those years for that, those amounts. So those were placeholders to reflect the 6.6 .6 billion total, but not specifically identified as projects. We're just identifying that they're in the plan, but we have yet to develop the estimates and the timing to reflect those projects. So there's always competing interests and priorities, um, and transit is one and a good one, and so like I'm happy to see <laughs> that there's 4.2 there, but you know, how are we going to work forward on that additional two plus billion dollars um, to decide how it should be allocated 
um, and when would that work start? So through the chair, um, the work regarding the capital plan is going to be an evolution. So as we go through prioritization exercise, the TTC will be informing us of, of prioritization around their, uh, their vehicle acquisitions, state of good repair, et cetera. So that money has to be specifically targeted against uh, transportation. So again, as the, as, the, as the overall plan matures, we will have better informed information to help it, council make those decisions. So, um, so for example, the, the housing part of it, or the new capital project part of it, um, we have unfunded ma major infrastructure projects. Um, that can, that's still going to be worked out and will come back to us again um, in a future year. Correct. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Nunziata. I have a few questions. Uh, first of all, on page five, slide five, can you explain um, car houses? What are car houses? Three, st three street car car houses. Are they are they garages? Oh, okay. Why are they called the car houses? I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, transit term, is it? All right, okay. That's what I assumed. On page 24, slide 24, um, by positions funded by Metrolinx on the Eglinton RRT, are these permanent positions? Through the chair, no, they're temporary. They're helping with the startup. Okay, so that would be for, for how long? Is it a, until, 20, yeah. an, until they open, which is scheduled for 2021. Okay, so they're, they're hired yes. in 2020 to 2021. Correct, yes, and they're paying for those. Physically. But Metrolinx yes. is paying for them. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Okay, uh, now I'm concerned about the fair vision. Um, so we lost a lot of money in 2018, millions of dollars through that. Um, can you tell me, um, I know that you're making attempts on hiring, you know, uh, staff on what, what was the total loss in 2019? So through the chair, um, the auditor general came through and did some observations to try to quantify, extracting out from those was about $65 million. Subsequently, uh, staff at the TTC has also gone out to kind of audit that to see whether we could uh, come up with similar kinds of um, estimates. And so we have just finished that work and we've identified that that is about within the range of, of what we think is happening out there as well, with most of it being on streetcars. So, okay, so how much, what, what's the total? $65 million. That, that was in 2018. So $65 million in 2019? Well, it's based on a, an estimate on activity, right? So, so we're, we're still estimating in that range. Through you, Chair, if I could. So um, yes. I don't understand why it's taken us so long to address this very serious issue. That's correct. We have a report that will be going to the board on February 24th addressing this issue. We did an audit a year after the AG did her audit in an area of which we were, we had very much open stations without turnstiles in them if you recall during the whole transition to Presto. At the end of last year, we were able to finally close the system in the stations whereby we didn't, we no longer have those empty, those open gates. We've also had the bodies that were uh, approved in the 2019 budget starting to flow in now. Uh, and we have a brand new deployment plan with what we're recommending as well that'll go on the 24th of February. We're taking it very seriously uh, with the deployment and the closing of the uh, stations. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Just a couple of, um, couple quick questions. Uh, when we look at completing the press, sorry. Oh, when we, I don't know if your mic's on maybe. Uh, when we look at completing the press payment system transition, uh, how much does that cost the TTC in 2019? So, uh, uh, through the chair, um, there's uh, 
we're uh, paying for uh, some legacy fair media processing still at, at our revenue oper operations facility and also for the uh, Presto Commission at the same time. Um, uh, our revenue operations department also includes cash collections. So in, uh, on the legacy side, including the cash collections, around $20 million, in addition then to our Presto Commissions on top of that. Sorry, how many million? So uh, revenue operations, uh, supporting both cash collections and legacy fair media, it's around uh, $20 million, and then there's about $50 million for the Presto Commissions. Um, what are we anticipating as we're moving off of that, as we've moved mm -hmm. off that and into next year, what do we anticipate that'll cost us? Yeah, so um, th th through the chair there, we're about uh, six, about $6 million is being removed through the 2020 budget as we eliminate the legacy fair media. Um, and we will uh, continue to look at, um, as we, um, as we uh, stop collecting uh, legacy fair media, there will be further savings in future years. Uh, in terms of additional expenses that we've incurred of over this long rollout that we're pursuing with Metrolinx, uh, is that accounted or has that been built into the budget as revenue that we will be collecting? collecting back from them? Through the chair, not for Presto per se. Um, what we have included in here is the recovery of the incremental service that we've been asked to provide through the construction period of the Crosstown and through Finch West, and so that's $19 million we're, trying, we're seeking to recover. For 2020? For 2020. Okay. Um, 7.8 billion backlog by 2029. Um, how much federal and provincial funding are we assuming that we'll get on that 10-year window to help with that? Do we, do we forecast that? At this point, we have not forecasted a, a cent from that. Okay. Other than, um, by extension, whatever federal, base federal and provincial gas tax that's currently in the 10-year capital plan. Okay, and so when I'm looking on that's slide 39, a um, couple things there. The development charge piece is a, uh, it's a small sliver there layered on top of the city funding. Um, why, could you speak to how we allocate development charges with respect to capital for transit and as that comes to the TTC and why we're seeing that sliver get smaller and tighter as we go forward? So through the chair, um, like all other programs, there has to be eligible expenses and we have to be able to identify the, the, that component that is truly growth. Mm -hmm. Recall that you know many of the expansion projects that used to be part of this budget are now gone. So when we do look at whatever our capital projects are, if we can actually quantify some portion of actual growth to it, we do apply it. So if Bill 107, legislates and removes our ability to do transit expansion effectively. We're not doing transit expansion. That was a provincial government decision. Um, does that reduce our ability to collect development charges and allocate to transit as it's, would the argument be made that it's not growth related if we're not delivering that? So through the chair, I haven't heard the latest regulations. I thought it was more on the social services side. I'm not. I don't know if folks have confirmed I don't know who would have the answer to that. whether transit is uh, still eligible as part of our, our, hard, court, our hard services. Uh, so to the extent that um, it's defined as a hard service, we would still be eligible for any growth, but that would be at the point in time that we determine we're going to do more expansion here, of course. Okay. Um, uh, through the yeah. chair, I, I, I just think it would be important to note as well, um, that the last DC bylaw that identified the eligible projects uh, predated a lot of the increased projects that we've added to the TTC's 10-year capital plan. So moving forward toward, towards the next DC bylaw, there's an opportunity to define further eligible projects and potentially increase the level of DC funding allocated to TTC. So that's an opportunity. Uh, when's the next DC bylaw where we can explore that? Uh, it's in the, I don't have the exact date. I think it's in the next one or two or three years? I believe two years, but we can get you the exact date. Okay, great. Uh, and then maybe last question. I'm seeing like on that same slide, um, sort of a, I guess when we get onto the 2029 projection over that 10 years, we're looking at the federal and provincial funding, uh, obviously a much smaller portion. 
how uh, how do we anticipate what that's going to come in at? What that looks like? Are those conversations that we're having with them? Slide thirty nine. Yes. Yeah. So through through the chair, uh, the <coughs> so what's here is what we know, right? Essentially, and so of course you know there's a, there are opportunities to advocate for additional funding, but clearly PTIF one is coming to an end. Right. And the only PTIF two funding is associated with those priority projects. So this is the five hundred million for Young Bloor. And what we now we're doing PTIF three. And there we in, until there's such time as there's a PTIF three, yeah. or any other opportunities, maybe through uh, their energy program for say um, some e vehicles. Uh, we have not accounted for any additional uh, opportunities at this time. Is there an opportunity for the provincial and federal government to make a contribution to operating a historic first uh, through PT3 negotiations? That's your last question. Thanks. Just knock it in there. Okay. Yeah. Um, that would be um, something that would we would all, I think, appreciate, but the likelihood would be, I think, something that would require a lot of the unprecedented. Okay, <laughs> the thanks. Unprecedented. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, and thank you much for your uh, your work. And we'll, so what we'll do is we'll take a recess now for one hour. Um, we'll be back at well, let's come back at one forty-five. Um, the only thing on the agenda will be the briefing notes, so I'm hoping that that'll go fairly quickly, and we'll be done within fifteen twenty minutes after that. So we'll recess till one uh, forty-five.